in medical records. This is the faceless man. Wow. Yeah, multiple of us. Yeah, yeah where's your face? I'm an office monkey uh, at, at a cancer clinic, so. Oh, wow. Sam, we met at the no, first and only at the uh, Tiki Bar Society of San Francisco. Oh, cool. Yeah, didn't recognize you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you. You know what? I think it may have, I think it may have started oh, a new stream. Yeah, you started a new link, unfortunately. Also, can you it switch says, to oh, yeah. gallery view rather than speaker view? Oh, cool. So it shows all of us? Oh my God, what is happening? <laughs> it's a nightmare. <laughs> uh, time loops. Crazy time loops are happening. We're in a time loop. Should we just use the new link? <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably best. I couldn't figure out how to get the old one to work. And then uh, if, if you guys could like figure out how to tell the world about that, the world I'm is sending like, them over. You know, the, I'll shout the, it out the window. Hold up. The eight of us and the three other people that will care about this. Did you just post? Is the new Someone one working? Someone post in the chat of the original one. Yes. Yeah, new one's working. Who's playing video games? What? I know exactly who that is. <laughs> I was like, I hear somebody having fun. Can't let that happen. <laughs> it's a party. People are allowed to have fun. Absolutely. Is anyone drinking anything? I've got some. Uh, it's like a Moscow Mule. No, not Moscow. It's with it's with bourbon. What Kentucky Mule. Kentucky Mule. Thank you. Ooh. I drank my first cup of coffee today because I didn't even really put on pants until noon. So. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not wearing pants now. But you guys don't need to know that. Yeah. Keeping it classic. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, a purple gin and tonic? Who's having a purple yeah, gin? Yeah, why is it purple? <laughs> the gin is blue. Um, Empress. Oh, yeah. Love That's Empress awesome. gin. Beautiful stuff. That's from Victoria, right? Mm -hmm. It's from Victoria. But you can buy it in, oh, dope. You can buy it in Seattle, too. They sell it at the THC liquor store. Oh, you're a little quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're very quiet, Kelly. Let me turn on my settings. Pump up the jams. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. that's great. Every time I log into Zoom, it turns my input down really low. It's the patriarchy at it again. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want. They want to keep me quiet. <laughs> okay. I guess I should. Yeah. Tweet out the new link, maybe. Yeah, let's see. I'll open up the old Twit box and see if did did anyone else uh, tell Twitter about this, or should I do that? I've been uh, tweeting it, so I'm going to do it again once you've uh, once you post it. Something, Richard, all yeah. Up. Oh, uh, Camilla, did Camilla do the the actual? Camilla's here. What about Camilla? Oh, did you did you post the uh, the correct? <laughs> I just now? did. I just did. Awesome. I will just retweet you then. I'm going to do the same. Same here. Eva, can you text me the link? Yeah. Twitter, you're such an asshole. Hey, Jeremy, how's it going, man? Hey, it's good. Hey, we just hit 1,600 followers exactly. Ooh. Cool. Ooh. Exciting. And hey, that's a cool, uh, a cool, what is it, a tapestry behind you? That is, yeah. Is, do you like my, it's my banner. It's, uh, Ooh, I don't, I'm, you know, nice. I don't have my screen mirrored, so it's mirror mm -hmm. image, but uh, I know somebody pretty cool who did the design for yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet a really cool artist did that for you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love that. That was like early on in our career, and we still, <laughs> That we still use this at every event and on all of our business cards and fun things like that. Well, I'm honored. Is Garrett going well, to join should... us too? Who? Is Garrett going to join us as well? I don't think so. He's been having, um, he's, well, he might actually be playing Second Life right now. Okay. All right. That's like, all right. He's Aren't like, we all. 
He's like opened a bar there and like, I guess he's got like some Android organized crime who are trying to convince him to like run some sort of like cyber drugs for, I don't know. Anyways. Dude, I bet Second Life is having like a renaissance right now. Oh, totally. Yeah. I haven't thought about Second Life in so long. Yeah. Yeah. First Life. (laughs) It is. It has become the first. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Animal Crossing is my Second Life. Yeah, uh, back same. back when yeah, Second same. Life was was a thing the first time, the first Second Life, uh, I had a, a girlfriend at the time who uh, she was unemployed and um, she would just hang out at my house and and use my laptop to play Second Life, and she um, she got involved in I guess there's like a recreation of Gotham City. And, uh, you know, there's like people running around pretending they're Batman and the Riddler. And stuff. <laughs> and she, and she got, like, how many people are being Batman in this? Well, how, I mean, many Batman, how many Batman are there? I think that it was like important to these people that, that it was like they had they took this role playing seriously. And so, you know, there couldn't be a bunch of Batman. <laughs> Batman. And, Batman. Uh, Batman. It's Batman's. Thank you. Batman. <laughs> <laughs> and people. so she. Um, so she and she was a she's a writer and a poet and uh and she was like you know like oh what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna start uh the gotham tribune in this in second life and then she started like following people around and then writing articles about the things people were doing in fake gotham city in second yeah this is great what were the headlines Oh God, I don't even remember. I thought it was bizarre. I, I was working and, you know, a dad and stuff. So like, I thought it was really funny, but I also like, didn't have time to be like, oh honey, let me sit down and read your article about the Riddler's bank <laughs> job. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thus hey, is I the see, death of journalism. <laughs> I see Camilla's tweet, but I don't see a link in it. Oh, is it? I think there's a link in it. Yeah, all I see is a screenshot. Is there a link? Oh no! Of... Well, the quote tweet has a link in it. Oh, you have to click Does on it? the actual preview. Oh, right it there. it works because I just heard myself from. Oh, ago. weird! It's That's not working weird. on my iPhone. I take cool. no responsibility for this. Meh. <laughs> Richard, could you go to gallery view for the live stream so it's not like jumping around? Mm, how do I do that? There should be an icon. Upper right corner. Is that it? What's that view? That's. Did that you should just line up all of our videos. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> Gallery view. Is this it? Did it change anything? Suppose we'll see in the live stream in a second. There it goes. Yeah. Is that it? Okay. Cool. Now I see the see on my desktop. I see the link. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm. It's not showing up in mobile. For me. So. There you go. Mountain. I'm so happy to see your eyes, man. It's been it's- forever. It really has been. I'm sorry I haven't emailed you back. Uh, I've been okay. on call for like five days, so uh, it's uh, I just got off today, so I'm a little uh, tired and uh, catching up on communication. Sure. Well, uh, thanks for taking time out of your day to hang out with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm uh, enjoying the uh, occasional isolation uh, whenever I can get it. Yeah. Does anyone want to do a presentation yet? Yeah, who I'm good to go them? whenever, yeah. We've got one. Yeah? I've got one. Should we spin a wheel or do you guys just want to like Rochambeau spin for the it? Spin the spin wheel. The spin the wheel. Spin the wheel. <laughs> Introduce an element of chaos into this. Exactly. Yeah. Or we could pick rocks out of a bag, like pebbles. It might take some I like that. Time. Yeah. And if pull runes out or something. Well, if one of us picks the wrong rock, then we take the meeting outside and Stone them. <laughs> there, is, there is no outside anymore. Okay, so, so who all do we have? We have Mountain. We have Camilla. We have me, Ewell, uh, Callie, Eva, Sam, Liminal Earth. Is there anyone else? Is that all of us? Present and accounted for. Cool. Yeah. All right. 
So let's see if I can share that window and then spin a wheel. What I want to know is where's Yule's face? <laughs> yeah, I am not presentable, nor is anything around me. <laughs> yeah. Except my PowerPoint. That I'll die a... before I admit that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the backgrounds are for. Yeah. That's true. I could need a, a foreground and a background, like something that masks out your the shape of your face, but gives us something else. One of my friends that. made a uh, Instagram filter that does that. It's like this mask thing that he made. It's pretty cool. <laughs> awesome. Did you know that Zoom has a touch up appearances setting? I saw that what? earlier. It made my forehead lines disappear, and I was like, lies. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I can't figure out how to share the the wheel. We'll trust you. Yeah, that's right. We All right, we trust in the wheel. It's yes. more fun to see the wheel, but Did, wheel do provides. you know how to share your screen? Uh, yeah, because so you'll need buttons. to do that through so many buttons. At the bottom middle, there's one that says share, share screen, and it's green. So try that one. Uh, it's oh, good to share go. screen. Oh. Ah, That's my dog. Oh, oh yeah. Did you guys see a wheel? Yeah. 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 What a handsome wheel. Nice. Okay. All right. Wheel Wait a second. I don't want to be green. Wheel of <laughs> <me>. <laughs> Tough. Okay. So, how do we spin? Who will be the first sacrifice to the wheel, wheel? of names? Turn, turn, turn. <laughs> Please oh, throw no, me in the wall. Oh, no, not me. <laughs> 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 I love the conceit. Right. Rig. You're a winner. All right, all right. So now I'm going to share a different screen. You have to close the screen share and open a new one. Is there a button to do that? Uh, the bottom middle, there should be a thing that says end screen share. share. It's red. Mm -hmm. I've been using Zoom for work for the past year, so it's just more of the same for me. <laughs> Richard, is my audio coming through? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, cool. Did you guys see the anatomy of time? I do. Sure yes. Do. Every time okay. I close my eyes. Give me, <laughs> just give me, give me a sec and I'll, I'll be ready for that. Maybe this is his presentation. <laughs> Very avant-garde. <laughs> yes. The anatomy of time begins now, ends never. Cool. Oh, there it popped up on the on the YouTube. There's like a couple minute delay. All right. I feel like I should do my performative time scanner voice, but I'm not gonna. All right, well, welcome. My name is Time Scanner, and today I'll be giving a brief overview on the anatomy of time. First of all, who am I? Uh, well, I'm a former field agent from the Time Bureau. I'm the sole resident of the heat death of the universe. I uh, was once absorbed into Time Crystal Omega, and uh, I'm a big fan of Otis Redding, classic R&B music. And I am the holder of the Atlas Hyparxis, the compendium of all knowledge of all things. First, let's start with time. Philosophers have talked about time and what it may be for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm here to tell you what it actually is. Time is a living organism that branches. It has tentacles known as timelines, which extend through higher dimensions. Each conscious choice that we make or each travel through time results in the tentacles splitting and the organism growing. Here's an artist's depiction of the organism of time. And here's a detailed view. This gets into the moment of creation. We'll talk about the moment of the creation of our time organism in a minute, but um, first of all, let's just talk about what is an organism, right? I mean, uh, the basic qualities of an organism are, you know, you need to eat, you need to breathe, you need to grow, you need to move around, and you have to be sensitive to the things in your environment, and you have to shit. 
Uh, you have to reproduce. Uh, this is a little iffy since we can only know what exists within our own organism of time. We assume that it may be a species of which there are many of them. And we do have some clues as to how our universe was born, our organism of time. <clears throat> First of all, let's just start with nutrition and respiration. What does time eat? Is there something outside of time for time to eat, right? I mean, like when you're talking about the organism of time and space, all possible timelines in all possible universes, like what's outside of that for it to ingest? <clears throat> well, outside of space time, it's, it exists in something that we call in the Time Bureau conceptual space. It's not really space. It's an infinite field in which all possible ideas exist in an amorphous and non-physical haze. It's, uh, it, it has infinite dimensions and every point in conceptual space touches every other point in conceptual space in an infinite number of ways. These are called associations. Time absorbs ideas from conceptual space in order to grow. Well, animals uh, and entities within time, what they do is they have ideas. They, they uh, reach a communication with the, uh, the pieces of information in conceptual space and they think of them as their own. And then through those, it influences them to make decisions. And those decisions divide the timeline into new and new timelines. <clears throat> and that is how it grows. So we'll add growth in there as well. Okay, so that takes care of a few of our, hey, yeah, that takes care of nutrition, respiration, and growth. I'm super excited to get to the excretion part. I want to know how time shifts. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's fascinating. I'm sorry if this goes over five minutes. Oh, when there's a limit. Oh, uh, real quick. No, there's I no think, limit. Just, uh, you know, when I think you're... it's more fun if everybody's off mute and we can kind of like comment and heckle as we go so he's not just like speaking. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> Unmute yourselves, guys. And... Yeah. I'm going to be, I'm gonna be, be asking shy. some questions during mine. So it's like, I, I would highly encourage you all to yeah, be yeah. on unmute. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be very lonely. <laughs> I want the time scanner voice. That's my heckle. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I could. Yeah, okay. Same. I mean, I feel like you're oh kind my of god! Who was that? That's all. That's also why I'm muted. It's because I have uh, <laughs> a Mars dog behind me. Yeah, tell me about your Martian dog, Sam. Uh, well, this was your time, but uh, hold on. Show us the dog. Where did it come from? <laughs> this is Neon from the Void of Space. Oh. Uh, he's four months. Whoa. Um, I love him. Yeah, and it's a, it's like you know, it's this is this is my entire social network. Uh, yes, <laughs> it was a perfect time to get a dog, Sam. That's yeah, great. it was actually. It was it, was, yeah. it was good. So now I have like structure to my day, like walk mm -hmm. the dog, feed the dog, walk the dog again. That's kind of what organizes my day, which is good. So that dog is going to be so well bonded to you. It's going to be great. Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> it's yeah. a great time yeah. to raise a puppy. So, oh yeah. Yeah, you yeah. Get, it's like you got a little paternal leave for your dog. <laughs> yes, yeah, sort of an American unpaid paternal leave. It's like, it's like, uh, I mean, people were talking about like, yo, your dog's gonna have a lot of like attachment issues because like when you're not home all the time. And I was like, the dog will or I will, you know. <laughs> so anyway, he's a sweetheart. Neon. You said the, the name is Neon? His name is Neon. Yeah. It's a cool. great name. It's a fantastic name. I've seen Neon on Instagram. It's it's nice to see a, a tiny little picture in the corner of our video. Right? Yeah, I've um I've pretty much become a person who just posts dog stuff to Instagram. That's who I am now. So sorry, I didn't mean to bogart your like. I mean, you're talking about like hitting, <laughs> and I'm just like, I got a dog. But you did ask me to unmute myself, so that's what you get. <laughs> Listen. No, no, I dig it, man. Uh, this is not a formal thing. This is us hanging out. I thought this was very formal. Dog showing up in a video. <laughs> well, we can be is... formal for you if, we, if you want. We, we can all mute ourselves when you talk. I'll put on tuxes. Uh, so we're going to talk about how 
how does the organism of time move through conceptual space when it's a when it's something that's of infinite dimensions? It, it, what does movement through that even mean, right? Well, <clears throat> there, here we're going to do a little a little experiment to see how you move through conceptual space. Take any two ideas. Uh, earlier today, I randomly picked an orange and a white kitchen tile. How do you, how do you, uh, how do you travel from an orange to a, uh, a kitchen tile, right? And, and we can do that in infinite numbers of ways. One is, you know, you imagine taking out an orange and you put it on a kitchen tile and you take a sharp knife and you slice into it. And all of those sensory experiences that you associate with those two things, you've got the, the oil from the rind spraying out onto the kitchen tile, creating little dots that will come sticky if you don't clean them up. And you've got the scent of citrus spraying in the air. Um, You've got the, uh, the, the taste of it. Maybe your association is that when you were a kid, you used to go to the Orange Julius store in the mall and, uh, and you were waiting for your treat and you were too short to see over the counter. So you were just standing there facing the side of the counter and you saw uh, nothing but white tiles until your mom handed you your Orange Julius. And all of these ways are ways of, moving from one concept to another within conceptual space. I'm glad that moved over an inch. That was, that was great. <laughs> that was, that was dramatic as hell. <laughs> <laughs> so that's called association. And uh, sometimes when the organism of time wants to move throughout space time, throughout conceptual space, what it does is it prompts synchronicities. It, it makes it so that it feeds these ideas into uh, the minds of, of beings within space-time. So that they have two ideas or more ideas at the same time. And through this, they, they, uh, it creates epiphanies where they, they create uh, inventions and they, they move the timeline in that direction because of that. This is how the organism of time moves its tentacles and sprouts new tentacles in ways that it wants to. And because these, this is why you have inventions that happen all over the world at the same time. It's because uh, the, the organism of time is trying to swim through conceptual space in this way. <clears throat> um, so basically uh, sensitivity, I'm lumping in there too, sensitivity to your environment. Uh, it's aware of the concepts around it and uh, decides to move through it in that way. I made this thing 20 minutes ago, guys. All right, let's go. So we've gone through those ones. What do we have next? Oh, excretion. Yes. Hell favorite. yeah. <laughs> All right. Hit me with it. So uh, oh. certain timelines, things can go wrong in them and they can become toxic and you have to excrete them. You have to get rid of them in some way. Quick question. Is that happening to this timeline? Uh, I can neither confirm nor deny, but hell yeah. That's exactly what's happening. <laughs> And uh, so someone gets a really bad idea. There are ideas that can spoil an entire timeline when they get out there. And, um, and it becomes a dangerous to the health of time itself. And uh, in order, a lot of times uh, this will cause mass extinction just from the, own, you know, the sheer stupidity of the beings within that timeline. They kind of kill themselves off. Or Sometimes as time agents, we are asked to go and amputate or prune a specific timeline because it's dangerous. How do I make a donation? <laughs> yeah, is there a Patreon? <laughs> are you saying that the timeline that you find yourself in now is a good candidate? Suboptimal. Mm -hmm. I don't know, actually, you know, it's, it's, the, it's theoretically possible that each of us right now on this chat uh, you can hear the dogs barking, uh, is in a different timeline and we wouldn't really know. I mean. That's true. Yeah, I'm outside of time. So I, but I, I'm reaching out to at least most of you within the same timeline because because uh, uh, I like you guys, you guys are my friends. I keep coming back to this timeline for some reason. I don't know why, there are certainly better ones. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, reproduction of time is a little weird. So um, 
what we know of this basically comes from fables that we found in the Atlas Hyparxis, which is uh, the compendium of all knowledge. And we don't really know if it's true or not, but we suspect. <clears throat> so we do believe that there was a time before our uh, living organism of time existed as an organism, right? It's birth, if you will. And uh, we're gonna have an analogy here. So this is, um, this is before living time. And what we have is a straight line. There's a beginning and an end. Think of this as a story. This is a story that is not alive. The characters don't have free will. It's like when you read a book, the book doesn't change the second time you read it, right? So we believe that there was a story that happened before. And at some point in the story, one of the characters discovered uh, what we now call time crystal alpha. The first time crystal. Now time crystal alpha, um, <clears throat> it was in the shape of a cube, uh, you know, cubes or crystals too, think of salt crystals, except this one's huge. And uh, some people also call it the unchangeable object. On the outside of the unchangeable object, time crystal alpha, there was a uh, language and code that basically explained the secret of time travel and how to use time crystal alpha to travel through time. And as soon as that was discovered within the story, think of the story as like soil and time crystal alpha is the seed. As soon as this happened, people within the story, they had freedom to change their story and this branches off into more and more different choices. And this is the moment that we have a living timeline, the organism of time. It's beautiful. That was a great transition. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Uh, so there we have uh, the, the one on the right is the one that I did last night uh, when I had time. And then the one on the left is the one I did an hour ago and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here's a, a painting depicting uh, the, the time crystal alpha as well. And looks an awful lot like a Rubik's cube. Yeah. Can you solve it? Well, can you solve it? Uh, I personally can't. Um, I, you know, I, I do have access to the Atlas Hyparxis, uh, which has all of the information in the universe, but I am, am also severely ADHD. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that I'm the one to make sense out of it. Uh, so basically, I would imagine that digging through that, that omnibus of information is a real pain in the ass too. Yeah. You know, and it, 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 it doesn't, it's not a page turner, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so this, we, uh, as time scanner, uh, now I page through, uh, stories and I'm looking to, uh, to create life within that by giving uh, characters within stories uh, the ability to live, breathe, grow, eat, shit, experience the universe. And, uh, and I, I think that we're all going around trying to find stories in life that, that we can- No, and it-, it, it, it. And that is my presentation. So let's see, how do I unshare? There should be an option. There you go. Yeah, there Just you like that. that. There you go. So if our timeline were to be ended with us in it, what would our experience be like? Would it just stop? Do you mean your branch, your tentacle? Yeah, your, yeah. Your timeline tentacle? Uh, so, oh, okay, so that's a, that's a good thing. So what, it, what, you, what you would experience is a reality decomposition so um, what would happen is once you're severed from the main organism, um, the cell walls that help create a cohesive logic to the universe start breaking down, just like, you know, like if you chop off a, a tree branch and then you throw it in the dirt, uh, eventually they start to decompose and dry and wither. And uh, those cells, you know, like uh, they start to, uh, become dust that can just blow away into into conceptual space. And so I think I'm not saying that we've already pruned this timeline, uh, but I do think that you may see examples of the cohesion of a coherent reality breaking down even now. Sure seems like it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or should we move on to someone else's presentation? I have a question about the time crystals. Oh yeah. Um, do, do, is it possible for us to know how many, how many time crystals are out there? Does the, does, does your bureau have information on that kind of number or is it just like one of those big unknowable infinites? Uh, there are maps of where some of them are at. We don't know where all of them are, um, but uh, they're, they're strange. You know, that's one of the main mysteries of, of the universe when you're a time agent is uh, it's, it's the, the nature of the time crystals. Where do they come from? Why do they sprout new organisms of time if they do? Uh, you know, it's like, it's like knowing what happened before the Big Bang in a sense, uh, but on a, a, a grander dimensional scale. Thank you. Yeah. Would anyone prefer to go next? Or shall I spin the wheel? Wheel. Spin the wheel. Spin the wheel. Spin the wheel. Spin the wheel. Spin, spin, spin. Uh, I'm not sharing the screen. I'm just going to tell you. That's too many clicks. Uh, next up, we have Mount Ennui. Ooh, Ooh, nice. Good choice, the wheel. Auspicious. Okay, all right. Okay, so I'm gonna. Uh, so I don't. I don't. Uh, I, I give. I give lectures from time to time, and uh, I find that the absolute best way to do them is to uh, make them way in advance. Don't ever review them. Don't ever practice them. Uh, and just try to vaguely remember what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so this is a uh, just classic, uh, classic approach for me. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Oh, share screen. Desktop one. Is that a thing? Oh no, I'm sorry. I have to open system preferences. My apologies. God, what a horrible fate. Oh man, I have to quit. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. I have to quit. Apparently, I have to you do. <laughs> I will be right back. Oh, okay. He's running away. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, everybody, stay calm. It'll be okay. Mm, I think this okay. is all part of the PowerPoint. It's pretty weird so far. Like, well, he's gone. Everybody, say nice things about him. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to end up in his shoes in a minute. <laughs> Camilla, Camilla, Camilla is process. very still. I'm, I'm impressed at how still Camilla is standing. Yeah. It's impressive. I, I think uh, Camilla moved to a different room because that uh, that background is a bit different than it was before. The, the two gray pillars on either side of her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the zoom lighting is impeccable, though. Jeez. Yeah. Amazing. That's yeah. true. That's it's true. Kind of looks like she's in the same place that Yule is. I mean, yeah. I'm in the place. I'm not even in spatial reality at this second. Are you in conceptual space? That's why your video isn't on. Yeah, I'm in, uh, I'm in what a... call Mayong's jungle, which is the space where everything that doesn't exist is. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. I still think of that as the dot on the Jeremy, bury me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love Jeremy, bury me. Yes. <laughs> they were nominated for a Hugo for that episode, I think. I hope so. God, that was brilliant. It really was. I was like, that was one of those things that when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, I'm so jealous that someone got to write that. That was just absolutely brilliant. Given that I have an important question, Richard, have you seen the time knife? <laughs> um, it's it's in my time washer right now i um i know that i shouldn't put it in the washer i should wash it by hand but i'm lazy yeah. welcome back camilla thank you i'm glad to be back where did you go um no 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 you don't need to tell us <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mountain Do you want to see my cat? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, I think there's a button yeah. I have to click to let Mountain back in. Oh, oh yeah. No, it's the waiting room. Yes. I thought this was a part of the bit. 
Here's Time yeah. Scanner being a gatekeeper, like always. Where, it's it's kind of it's basically the Black Lodge of Zoom. Fuck! Look yes. at that cat. <laughs> yes. This is Gwen. Uh, she has one too. eye. Oh, I want to scramble that one. Are you there? Where's your other eye? Hey, it got bit out by a dog. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Yeah, but yeah. now she lives with me and she's fine. And she's not any less of a cat. In fact, I think she's even more of a cat. Whatever that means. <laughs> oh, Richard, it's back on it's back on speaker view. Could you do gallery view again? Oh, sure. I was just trying to let Daniel in. Mountain. Mm -hmm. Daniel. He was I there for a minute. I like that Rob Zombie song, More Cat Than Cat. <laughs> Is it the correct view? Is that the view that works? Uh, so we'll see in a few minutes. There it goes. Cool. Uh, Mountain, you have some strange human's uh, name on your thing. <laughs> I don't know if that, oh, they're good. It fixed, it, it, it's fixed now. <laughs> okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, all right, let's see, let's, let's try this again. Desktop one, activate. Whew, there it is. Okay, can you see all this garbage? Yeah, I can see yeah. all the garbage. Yep, all there the it garbage. is. Okay. All right, let's go. Oh this man, oh, beautiful. Hell yeah. Okay. Very nice. Okay. Thank you for all joining uh, for for joining me for this lecture. Uh, uh, as as is uh, tradition, uh, Richard is is very conceptual and awesome. Uh, this one is uh, very much rooted in just the disgusting realities of our world. All we're... right. Uh, this is titled "Weird Science." We're going to be going through some interesting studies that people have done and talking about them. Uh, content warning. Uh, fair warning up front. There is a lot of butt stuff here. So um, please, uh, if that bothers you in any way, uh, you know, take a, take a moment uh, to walk away and get a, a, a frosty beverage. Uh, these are my qualifications. This is my CV. Um, I don't know who sent me this, but I saw this and I've never identified with a picture uh, more than this picture. Uh, okay, so pop quiz. What month are you most likely to engage into some consensual butt play, lose something <laughs> in your butt, and have to go to the ER to get it taken out? So are these all three separate or? events? This, oh, that's, uh, that's got to be Valentine's Day. Yeah, February. February. Okay, so we got two for February. Anything else? July. July? Oh, I don't know, oh, just July. a feeling. Hmm. And, anybody else? I'm going to go no, for November. April because that's um, National Suicide Prevention Month. Um, okay. Maybe they're related. Okay. I'm, I'm right. going to say St. Patrick's Day, March. St. Patrick's Day, okay. I'm going to go with November. Okay. Thanksgiving. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you know, you're, you're the closest to it. It is actually October. <gasps> ah, yes. The spookiest month. The spookiest month also happens to uh, answer this question. So there was a, a great paper that was written called Seasonal Variation of Rectal Foreign Bodies, <laughs> Data from a Nationwide Inpatient Sample. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, so this looked, uh, this wanted to look at seasonality and <clears throat> behavior. So human behavior changes based on the season. Somebody looked at this and said, does that apply to butt stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I personally like to send a thank you to doctors Pathak, Karmasharya, and Al Weiss, because these are the really hard hitting clinical questions. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you open up uh, uh, some of these things and, and look at these, uh, look at the numbers. Uh, so January, 306 rectal foreign bodies out of 7.6 million uh, admissions. That's a lot. Um, is it though? And if you look, it, that's the real question. It is, this is like a fraction, <laughs> a fraction of a fraction. So, uh, so actually, yeah, if you look at it, it, there's a slight undulation to our curve. If we do a line of best fit here, uh, it's, uh, it kind of peaks in the cold months. So uh, they theorize a few things. So maybe this is disruption of circadian rhythm leading to disruptive behaviors in at-risk individuals, which I would like to point at the three three doctors who wrote this and say, not cool guys. <laughs> um, yes, there are variations to human behavior, but calling this disruptive behavior and calling us at risk individuals is not okay. 
Big yikes. Uh, their takeaway from this was that high suspicion at this time of year may help promptly diagnose and avoid unnecessary investigations, to which I'd respond, if you wake up on October 1st and you're an emergency room doctor, are you really going to think, huh, I should probably think about some butt stuff this time of year. Uh, you know, maybe I'll ask my next patient that I have about this uh, if they come in with unexplained abdominal or and or butt pain. Um, I, I don't necessarily think this is a great, uh, great hard hitting um, uh, research, but it's definitely interesting. And, uh, and for that, I thank the doctors who wrote this. Uh, a brief related detour. Uh, systematic review of colorectal foreign bodies. If you're interested in the sorts of things that people actually lose in their bodies, here's a, a little <laughs> breakdown. Uh, so things. just the neck of the bottle. Uh, just oh the God, neck. no. Just the oh, neck. No. Oh no. <laughs> so a torch was it lit? <laughs> or is that like a flashlight? Oh, yeah, a flashlight. Yeah. That makes a lot more Butane sense. Butane gas you. cylinder. <laughs> <laughs> it could um, be like a dungeon torch, like a yeah. That's what, that was my first Skyrim, time. like yeah. waiting yeah. for somebody to call out the apple. So, <laughs> <laughs> the so, two albums, um, actually. So this is all, you know, this is actually all of the non-sexual stuff. There is actually sexual for dildos and vibrators, which I left out. Uh, those are obviously clearly the tops. Uh, These people. The but we've all found ourselves, you know, in the winter months, thinking oh, I'm so lonely. Oh my gosh, I just need something to fill that void in my butt. All these things, <laughs> not interesting, no. And all I have is that bicycle inner tube. Yeah, exactly, you just have the bicycle <laughs> inner tube. But then you're standing in your apartment and the, uh, the light comes in the window and it alights upon your desktop where you see unspecified cylindrical <laughs> object with iBook. <laughs> oh, no. And you know. Oh dear. It's time to get busy. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. hell yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on. Pop quiz. Approximately what pressure in kilopascals do penguins generate to blast their poops away from their nest? Any guesses? 420. <laughs> <laughs> An excellent guess. Uh, can we get some sample pressures from Thank other you, organisms dude. to yeah. use to Oh gosh, you know, if I if I, I should have made a chart, I <laughs> uh, you, you can just throw out some numbers in kilopascals. I'll give you a hint: four hundred twenty. Uh, their colon would probably explode like a grenade. Okay, what about sixty nine? Sixty nine. Nice. That's actually a great. That's a great answer. Anybody else? Four hundred and nineteen. <laughs> mm, mm, the old Jeopardy trick. <laughs> no, no, no. You got to go for seventy if it's if you're doing Jeopardy, because then that includes everything, everything above it. 48. 48. Okay. All right. These are all these are all great guesses. Who said 48? Uh ooh. Oh, ooh. It's between 10 and 60. Uh, so that is thank you. Thank you for chiming in. That was that was great. Okay. So there were some uh, some folks who uh, wrote a paper called Pressures Produced When Penguins Poo, Calculations on Avian Defecation. They made a lot of interesting assumptions about humans. Uh, so this one, I don't really analyze the data. We're kind of going through and just pulling out some just real nuggets of just delightfulness <laughs> in this paper. <laughs> so anyone who's watched a penguin fire a, quote, shot from its rear end must have wondered about the pressures a bird generates, but apparently no published data on the pressures produced exists. Uh, let's see, translation. I think about birds pooping. I'm gonna make myself feel better by assuming everybody else is doing the same. Also, how dare someone make me work? <laughs> you gotta leave if your you... mark on the tradition of science. <laughs> from a few spot on photographs, we estimated the aperture from which the semi-liquid excretory material is released to possess a maximal diameter of eight millimeters at the moment of firing. I have a hard drive full of penguin butthole pics <laughs> that estimated the maximal diameter of a penguin butthole while shidden. Uh, since penguins prior to venting ascend the rim of pebbles that form the edge of their nest and are somewhat higher than their surroundings, we place the elevation of the cloaca uh, 20 plus minus 6 cm above the ground. I have also calculated the average <laughs> butthole to ground distance for the average penguin. <laughs> if the outflow velocity were constant during defecation, then the expulsion of the droppings would resemble a fountain, which of course does not fit the observed fecal removal pattern. Sorry, I had a brief fantasy of what it would be like if penguins shat in a fountain-esque fashion, and I hate that reality does not match up to that. <laughs> 
Uh, our best estimate for the semi-liquid feces of the penguin is a viscosity that lies between that of glycol and considerably below that of glycerin. Uh, oh. Olive oil seems a olive fair oil. approximation. Right. Ew. Technically, I'm outlawed from being near a penguin, and I'll have to estimate the viscosity <laughs> of their pupes. Also, I wanted to ruin olive oil for you. <laughs> so birds could theoretically increase their projectile defecation range by squirting 45 degrees upwards. However, their upright posture in position of the vent prohibits this in penguins. Vent means butthole. But in eagles and other birds of prey, the squirt is indeed directed upwards by approximately 15 to 30 degrees. Unpublished observation. This is just from his personal data. <laughs> <laughs> translation if i were god i wouldn't make i would make it so that all birds could shit upwards because fuck yes <laughs> now whether the bird deliberately chooses direction blah 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 blah. i need to see these birds shit in person so i'm trying to get my boss to pay for a trip to antarctica for quote science <laughs> so uh i want you to be prepared for this this is this is really just oh. fantastic this is this right here <laughs> the core of the paper everything that the you gravel need to know. pattern exactly yeah <laughs> everything you need to know about this pattern is about this paper is in this uh diagram so if you have any questions you know you're wanting maximum b-hole diameter things like that just check in there i want a t-shirt <laughs> that would be perfect <laughs> now let's it's assume you or your child swallowed a small plastic toy how soon should that toy show up in your poops i've always wondered uh, I'm going to say um, uh, 16 hours. 16 hours. Okay, that's good. So, all right. Anybody I'm going to say three days. Three days? Yeah, I'm going to go like like three to five. Three to five? Okay. Yeah. Well, do, do, uh, is this a specific toy that we should be thinking about? Uh, this is a Lego head. <laughs> oh, oh, a Lego oh, head. Yeah, that, oh, that was, Lego that was passed like pretty quickly. Hours, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a slinky yeah, is yeah. another story. It's not there. That's that's actually very true. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's actually 1.71 days. Oh wow! Now yeah. you might be asking yourself, who found this out? <laughs> Andrew Tag, Damian Rowland, Grace Leo, Katie Knight, Henry Goldstein, Tessa Davis, uh, all uh, put their lives on the line uh, to answer this question. Uh, I actually remember when this paper came out, and I read it, and I have never been the same since. Uh, so they decided, so this is actually a really common thing in pediatrics. Kids uh, swallow shit. Um, and uh, parents are always worried because they're like, I want my kid to have this quarter and or GI Joe and or Lego head come out of my child eventually. <laughs> and so Reasonable. they decided, let's put this to rest. So they talk about, you know, things, oh, there's a lot of harmful things kids swallow. Very true. Batteries, medications. Uh, it's a very common problem. Uh, so an early, uh, early work by Spitz, who I do not know, suggests that most coins pass within 3.1 to 5.8 days, no adverse effects. And the authors wondered, would a lighter toy pass more rapidly? And this is the core of the paper. There's a very, very long tradition of self-experimentation in the field of medicine. So, uh, Dr. Werner Forsman performed his own cardiac catheterization, which if you know what that is, that's fucking insane. Mm -hmm. uh, Barry Marshall <laughs> swallowed a flask of Heliobacter, Heliobacter pylori and immediately got gastritis. Shocker. Uh, some people in my neck of the woods uh, ended up injecting air into their abdomens and taking x-rays of it. Uh, pretty baller. Uh, I, I hope to someday join in this tradition. They decided to make two scales, the shat scale and the fart score. <laughs> they developed a stool hardness and transit score. Uh, this is for stool consistency over time. Post-ingestion stools are monitored and examined. So once you found it, that was your fart score, the found and retrieved time score. Uh, so a few things they found out. Females were more likely to retrieve the foreign body earlier or indeed at all compared to males. Uh, this study was low power. This is about six people. So it's not power to confirm whether that's statistically significant. Uh, but they do raise an important point. If an experienced clinician with a PhD is unable to adequately find objects in their own stool, uh, you shouldn't be asking parents to do that. Uh, secondary, uh, so the fart score is shorter than the estimated time of coins by a significant amount. Uh, they uh, kind of raise a few things. Maybe it's just a little smaller. Maybe we should, uh, you know, uh, swallow a little Lego man with an arm, uh, something sharp. Who knows? Maybe it'll pass. There's a few limitations, though. They couldn't be blinded. 
and uh, because that would require their partners to sort through uh, their uh, shit to find these things and uh, blah, blah, blah. This is all boring stuff. The main thing is that the very last thing they say, the fact that participants can chat themselves without specialist knowledge makes it an inexpensive tool. So, <laughs> uh, so this is just, a, just an absolutely great paper of people who uh, are absolutely uh, looking to investigate something that's actually useful to people and having fun at the same time. Last, top quiz. What is the caloric value of the human body? Ooh. Oh, man. Like if I were to eat an entire human body. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can, you can parcel it out however you want. But yeah, this is the total. What's the serving size? Uh, one 200,000 human, one human calories. One, one human being is a serving size. Okay. All right. Uh, so the average <laughs> in this, in this uh, paper, the average weight was 55 kilograms, which is for the most part average ish. 4,500. 4,500 calories? 4,500 calories. Okay. All right. I would say 300,000 calories. That was my guess 000. as well. Yeah, you guys are you guys I'm are barking guess at the right team. Ten thousand. Okay, ten thousand. One million. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> the answer: one hundred and twenty-five oh. thousand eight hundred twenty-three calories, uh, as uh, as discovered by Dr. James Cole. Uh, or maybe he's not a doctor. Uh, he's probably not a doctor. He's probably just an insane person. Uh, <laughs> so he looked oh, back wow. at research of these things, and they actually uh, broke out, and we're like what's the nutritional value of uh, the liver? Uh, and so oh, he broke good. it down by weight, weighed these things, figured out about how much, came up to a total of 125,822 calories. I would like to point out the fact that uh, teeth uh, was there. Average weight, 0 0.4 kilograms, seems about right. Nutritional value, 36 calories from teeth? Huh. I <laughs> How don't do you... know how I feel about that. I do not feel like there is any the sort of nutritional benefit for teeth. Is it those little you dangling like things? Grind... That... You grind them up. It's and your then face bones. Sprinkle it on stuff. I guess uh, so like, a, like a condiment. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I'd yeah. also like to point out that the total solid value of the body is 6.66. Nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Throwing that out there. Uh, this is all I have. I have other things, uh, but then they uh, start veering off in a very dark direction. And I was like, yeah, I don't really want to want to talk about that. How so, this, uh, yeah. How to pose tissue out from the rest of the parts? Uh, that's a good question. It's probably just sub Q. Uh, so you can't, obviously, you know, if you uh, blended up the liver, you may be able to divide out if there's any sort of like intracellular fat and things like that. But this is probably just them just scooping out the sub Q fat, just the stuff that's under the skin, macroscopic as opposed to microscopic got it okay none of us want to meet the guy who's just like yeah i only eat the nerve tissue <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh picky eater i see <laughs> now stop share okay Are you gonna eat I, all those I like teeth? how your other desktop <laughs> folders were bees what was it meat facts I don't know. I saw him for just a second, but I, I enjoyed what I saw. Good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> ah, I, I like the, uh, the, the ghostly Nate. That's good. Yeah, it's, it's really very nice. Spooky. It's very spooky. Oh, this and Ool has, a, Ool has a face now. Yeah. Hey. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks for sharing your face. It's a good face. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was just hiding behind some... Uh, some JPEGs for the sake of modesty. <laughs> this improves everything. Uh, should we spin a wheel again? Spin the, wheel. We spin the wheel. wheel. Spin the wheel. Okay. Isn't there a spin the wheel quote in Thunderdome? Oh. Eva, we just watched this. It's oh like, my God. spin the wheel, make the deal. Or yeah. Something like yeah. That. Oh. <laughs> I loved that movie as a kid. I actually, that was the, as a kid, that was the only uh, Mad Max movie that I saw, but I saw it over and over again because it was on HBO all the time. <gasps> Yay, Callie! Callie. Yeah, Callie. Callie! Okay. We have a winner. Oh, I I'm forgot to remove the <laughs> All right, let me unshare. There we go. All right, cool. Yes. Okie dokie. Um, do you guys want to close your eyes so that you don't see anything except the title yeah. screen for just a moment? Oh, yeah. I'll be back in just a sec. I'm sorry. I'll be right back as well. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Oh, hell yeah. 
perfect. Nick and Eva ha- and yes. Richard have already seen this before, but I figure more people need to know. They do. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started, or should I wait for the other people? Oh, let's go for it. I okay. say you kick it off. Yeah. Right, I'm yeah, just go, go for it. Fuck them. Um, so quick, oh, hold on. Quick heads up. Here we go. Um, in this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the trashy novel, not just the cover itself, as well as um, essential elements of what makes up a trashy book and the cover. Um, we're going to go through the evolution of trashy books to include fan fiction and e-readers. And then finally, we'll conclude with why you should be reading trashy books. So. First off, why am I qualified to talk about trashy books? Well, I have over 13 years of experience reading them. Um, As a child, I was too embarrassed to check out trashy books from the library, so I am very ashamed of this, but I would steal them from the library. Always return them illegally, but I did take them illegally from the library. Um, I have also gotten detention before for reading in class too often. Uh, It's the only thing I've ever gotten detention for. As well, when I finally did get an iPhone, I discovered that in the iBook section, Uh, You can download free books. The only books that are free are really terrible self-published novels, so I spent most of my day reading those, naturally. And finally, I am an avid collector of trashy books, and I really appreciate their terrible covers, Um, so it gives me a lot of insight into what makes a trashy book. Finally, when I was in college, I took a class on vampire romance literature because they offered it, and why would you not take that class? Um, And I got to buy things for my class, such as Dark Lover. So I do think (laughs) we're qualified to give this presentation. So let's go right into what makes, or the history of the trashy book itself. So I've put up some covers here. These are all real books that exist in the world and have been published. One thing to note is that trashy books um, do not apply to a single genre, gender, or age group. Um, They apply to all of those things. So it doesn't have to just be sci-fi or romance. It can be murder mysteries. It can be historical novels. Anything can have a trashy cover. Um, You may know trashy books by some of their predecessors, such as Penny Dreadful's Dime Novels or Bum Fodder, which is an interesting way to say that basically they would publish serialized parts of terrible novels in newspapers in England back in the day. And it was so terrible that people would rip them out of the um, newspaper and use them to wipe their butts. Um, And so they kind of coined this term for trashy literature to be called bum fodder, which I think is hilarious. Um, Secondly, uh, a lot of times when people associate, uh, when people think about trashy novels, they're thinking about the mass market romance paper books, uh, paperbacks in the grocery store. That's going to be a lot of what I talk about today. You'll see on the bottom here, we have this warrior's woman, um, which is part of an entire category of books called Highlander novels. You may or may not have heard of Outlander, which is probably the most famous one. Um, but they did become very popular in the 1950s, specifically for women and for women that were living at home because they were bored and suppressed and needed something to do. Um, finally, I'm mostly going to focus today on the romance and urban fantasy section of trashy novels because that's the thing I have the most experience in. And also, I find it very annoying when people only talk about high fantasy um, because high fantasy is great, but other genres also exist and are important too. So let's look at what makes up a trashy cover. This is a book I happen to own. It's called Discount Armageddon. It's part of a series of novels called Encrypted. Um, And this girl on the cover, she actually works at a uh, strip club called Dave's Fish and Strips, which I just think is incredible. (laughs) And and let's look at what is on this cover. So here we have multiple fonts. Uh, Usually there's three, four, maybe even five fonts on the cover because why not? You want to catch the eye of the person who's trying to find the book. Um, Here we have a sexy person. This could be male or female. Um, One thing I find interesting is that... uh, it kind of goes against heteronormative standards because this book is marketed mostly towards women and yet the woman on the cover is very sexy which I find very interesting that that isn't necessarily like oh we want to market to women let's put a hot guy on the cover it can be either way and finally an outrageously busy background because we want to make it confusing and horrible to look at let's look at another cover here Um, this is from a uh, book series called Chicagoland Vampires. I believe there's 12 novels in the series. I do own this one. I didn't think it was very good. So here we have, again, multiple font colors. I'm not sure what they were thinking with the yellow here. 
another sexy person, as well as weapons. Weapons are very important to the covers of specifically urban fantasy novels. Um, many of the characters do use weapons, but I just think it's interesting that they're on the cover. Very Buffy the Vampire Slayer-esque. And then finally, we'll move into this other cover um, for a book called When a Scott Ties a Knot. Now, you'll notice that we have all of the classical elements of a terrible book cover. We've got weird fonts, sexy people. Notice both a man and a woman here. We have the name of the series because, of course, uh, most trashy novels are part of a 10 plus series, not series of novels. And this is actually very similar uh, in a cover style to a bodice ripper novel, which is a type of romance novel that is generally very problematic, but super popular during the 80s. Now I have a question for you all, and that is, when do you think that this book cover was published? Speaking as somebody who bought one of these uh, for uh, a joke, uh, I would say more recent than you'd think, probably 2012. <laughs> uh, this was actually published in 2015, um, but you'll notice that you were very, you were very close there. You'll notice that the um, cover of this book looks very similar to things that have been published from the 80s, 70s, even sometimes the 50s. Um, one thing that's interesting to note about this is while it looks similar to a bodice ripper that you would buy as a joke because it would be hilariously bad, is that this is actually part of um, a new genre of romance where uh, you'll notice the series here is Castles Ever After. It's about landowning women. And the whole point of the plot is that these landowning women basically confront the idea of an alpha male and then realize that they have their own power um, and inherit their own land. So I just thought that was interesting because while the cover hasn't changed at all, the story definitely has. So now let's move into the age of the internet. Um, the internet totally made crappy and shitty book covers explode, as well as the genres that can have shitty book covers. We can't not talk about fan fiction. Um, obviously, you guys know uh, what Fifty Shades of Grey is supposedly fan fiction for Twilight. Um, well, down here on the bottom, you'll notice this cover that says after. This is actually a fan fiction that someone wrote about uh, Harry Styles from the boy band One Direction. Um, it became one of the most popular fan fictions and was actually turned into an original movie that you can now stream for free on Netflix. Um, but I just think it's hilarious because this is a very popular type of shitty cover where either fan fiction people or self-published authors will create their own covers and make their own shitty covers. Um, we also have here Taken by the T-Rex. Many of you might have heard of this as a gag, um, but shitty book covers don't necessarily just have to include humans anymore. They can include inanimate objects, they can include animals, Anything that is your kink, you can find a shitty romance or an urban fantasy novel about. Finally, as long as it's sexy. I mean, look at that T-Rex. Exactly. Whew. As long as it's sexy, you can put it on a cover. Finally, Are we veering into Chuck Tingle territory here? <laughs> Maybe. I just want to make one note here is that um, a lot of people who read these books uh, find the covers hilarious like I do, but a lot of people actually really like these covers. Um, this is just a comment I wanted to pull up from Goodreads which is, fuck my life, this is the most beautiful cover I've ever seen. <laughs> and that has 321 likes and 21 comments. So clearly people agree there's a market for these things. It will never die. Um, okay, let's move on. So why should you read trashy books? Well, for one, it helps aspiring authors. A lot of the people that write trashy fan fiction, uh, the fan fiction actually could be good, but maybe their cover is terrible or they're a self-published author, author. It helps them gain exposure if you read them, um, even as a joke, if you buy their books. And then eventually they can become authors and hire actual artists to do their covers. Uh, secondly, you can explore some diverse interests. Perhaps oh, you actual them. artists? Are you implying that this is not art? Everything <laughs> 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 is art, but you know, uh, maybe you didn't know that you were into T-Rexes until you read Taken by the T-Rex. Thirdly, um, they're hilarious. I often laugh out loud at just how terrible the covers are and I get to look at them every day because they're on my shelf. And finally, I am a fan, and a lot of people don't like this, of mass market paperbacks because they're really terrible quality. And so the spines do the most amazing thing. This is, some people are gonna like this, some people are gonna hate this. Every 60 pages, you can crack the spine open and it makes a lovely crunching noise and you can see how far along you are in the book. Um, so anyways, that's my presentation on why you all should be reading trashy novels such as Discount Armageddon, highly recommend. Um, and finally, 
here's just some resources if you're interested. Short history <laughs> the paperback novel, you can read about the romance novel. And also here down below, I have some book reviewers on YouTube. Chandler Ainsley reviews nothing but smut novels. Um, the Naughty Librarian is exactly what it sounds like. But the Book Goblin, he only reviews high fantasy, but he does so in the outfit of a goblin and the voice of a goblin. Um, so I highly recommend checking out these links. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed my presentation and I hope you go read more trashy books. Yay! That is incredible. Yeah! It's a rare treat to hear somebody talk about something they're clearly passionate about. And I'd like to let you know that that is like very, like, I, I want to go out and buy one of these right now because I'm like excited about your excitement. <laughs> please, please go buy more trashy novels. I think more people need to read them. Will, will uh, uh, PDFs be made available of the presentation afterward to distribute amongst the... We Because I want to go click those links, but... I know, right? Yeah. I'll share sure. the links with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, for a while, I worked at Value Village, like taking donations, and we would get these these uh these women uh usually a little little bit older women and they would drop off boxes of these at a time and then they would like go in to other stores and then buy all the trashy novels from those stores read them all and then redonate them at other stores to keep it circulating so that's like a, i love that that's beautiful yeah man. it's it's, it's this, really like little beautiful. underground market of uh making sure that that uh they stay rotating uh it's beautiful. Yeah. That's good. They, so uh, like, they might have more, they have been, those individual copies of books might have been read more times than like anything at the local library, except trash yeah. novels at the library. Yeah. It's been a wreck. Um, Kelly, I'm so sorry that I missed your presentation. I was helping with groceries. <laughs> that's okay. Oh, that's really good of you, Nate. What a good human. I love the, I loved it. Thank you so much, Kelly. I really yeah. appreciate it. That was awesome. Uh, hey, well, Richard. And, yeah. Um, I, I have I have changed my mind. Is it okay if I get put back into the the rotation for? Uh, yes. I would like yeah. to do my my presentation. Of course. Yeah, no me problem. too. I don't know if you saw, but I'm I have an eleven slide presentation. Yeah. Um, would anyone prefer to go next or? Um... Wheel. Wheel. I just want to be in the wheel. 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 Right. It has right. to be the wheel. 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 The wheel decides all of our fate. Let me the wheel put, provides. Okay, so let me see. Doo, doo, doo. I'm just putting Nick on the wheel. Where where is this wheel? Oh, it's on uh, the internet. <laughs> the e Are we gonna see the wheel or just gonna like be like one of the, the name? It's we like saw it last name. time. Um, I actually clicked I clicked the button already, so it's already spinning. Uh, but Nick, it came up Nick. Yes. yes. What really? <laughs> yeah. Is that okay? Shit. Seriously. Yeah, would yeah, you rather not? Um, well, so the, the only you can do the later. Do you want to do it later? I'm do. Let's do it later. We have to All do right. it on Eva's computer because this is an <laughs> we iPad. We have to switch. He's in the bedroom. Yeah. I'm in the living room. Sure, that's fine. I can make uh, a view. Let's see. I can I can share the wheel this time. All right. I just feel like it's like one of those you know presidential debates where they were like, we did a coin flip thirty <laughs> minutes ago, and <laughs> must trust us. Cool. All right. Spin the wheel. I like that we have a persistent data in the background, just like quietly chilling there. She's just vibing. Mm -hmm. Quietly go. chilling is all she does. Nice. Hey. <gasps> oh. Me. Okay, start in like 45 seconds. I need to get a beer. All okay, right, no yeah. problem. It'll take me 45 seconds to boot this shit up anyway. What um, is going on in Mount's uh, screen? What is like poking through? <laughs> What is that? Oh, what? for for Nate? No, or, for uh, for uh, Mount Anwe. Something is poking through the laser beams. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it's like a pillow or something. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. All right. I really, really love the way you can see the background through Nate's beard. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I wish uh, you can. You need like an animated beard that like has gifs that play. I found out you can put videos in this, and the only video I could find on my computer uh, that I was willing to admit was on my computer was uh, Ghost Watch, the uh, BBC special that's like a live event where they try to see a ghost. Yes. Oh, I okay. could potentially have Ghost Watch playing behind me and like in my beard, <laughs> but I feel like that would be a bit of a distraction. 
I have a friend who uh, on Zoom conference calls for work just makes like does a picture of himself at his desk and makes that his background and then just leaves. And... <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I hey, are you guys this. seeing the presentation slide or my yeah. note slide? Oh, I sure love what is happening Holy on the screen sure right now. I see a sexy cryptid. Cool. Yeah. You don't see my notes or anything though? No. I don't know. Okay, Unless your notes ahead. are 144, 112 AM. Those are, those are my notes. Yeah. Um, this is a Zoom <laughs> call full of sexy cryptids. So. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started then. Um, hello, my name is Eva Wood. And welcome to my presentation entitled Lesser Known Cryptids of the World. Oh my God. Yes. Hot or not. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In this presentation, we'll be looking at cryptids from all over the planet and evaluating them on the basis of whether or not they are totally bangable. So let's begin. <laughs> Can I, can I take a moment to just say my presentation was almost uh, picking out all of the Draculas in the world and rating them by how bangable they were. And so <laughs> I would just like to let you know, I'm so happy that you did this because I'm so sad. <laughs> there would have been like a conceptual bump there, but I still would have been really here for it. Okay. Maybe, Maybe next, next time. time. Maybe yeah. next time. This is the most excited I've been about a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> in my entire life. <laughs> so what is a cryptid? A cryptid is generally understood to be an animal or being whose existence is unsubstantiated or based on anecdotal evidence. So we're all familiar with these famously elusive, famously DTF cryptids. We've got Sasquatch, we've got Nessie, we've got the Jersey Devil, Chupacabra. But today we will not be focusing on these guys. Instead, we will be turning our attention to five lesser known cryptids. So I'll go ahead and just get started. Um, here is our number one lesser known cryptid, the Flatwoods Monster. What the fuck? So first spotted in West Virginia during 1952 uh, by three boys who were investigating a bright light in the sky above the woods. No, this is not a Steven Spielberg movie. They encountered a 10 foot tall monster with a round red face, a spade shaped hood and a black body with cloth like folds, which then hissed and glided towards them. Sick. It's like a D&D monster. Guys, hot or not? Hot. I'm going yeah. hot. hot. Yeah, hot. pretty hot. Absolutely hot. I'm going to have to go Absolutely. hot too. Yeah. Dude, I'd let it glide right towards me. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's tall. well dressed. She's levitating and hissing. What else could you possibly want in a woman slash otherworldly gender transcendent being? <laughs> she's beautiful. Number two on our list today is the Mongolian death worm. <laughs> oh, yes. Known to and feared by Mongolian nomads for centuries. Uh, have you seen Tremors? It's basically that. <laughs> <laughs> the Mongolian death worm lays eggs parasitically in the bellies of still living livestock. Oh, no. And eyewitness accounts describe the worm spraying deadly yellow venom that causes instant death. So how did they- That's, so, that's so fucking metal. <laughs> what do you think, hot or not? Pretty hot. Yeah, pretty hot. Something a lack of. Uh, I'm gonna go with. I work, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna say not. I'm gonna. I'm yeah, gonna yeah. Put down. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm say gonna absolutely, but not. isn't necessarily hot. I don't think I, violence is sexy, and that thing is like pure violence in tube form. So <laughs> not. The verdict is not. Oh. Woo. Yes. Boo. Come put your dick in that. <laughs> Some of us <laughs> like of pure violence in tube form. Come on, man! I don't have any cell reception out here. Seriously, don't. <laughs> Number three on our list is the Japanese Kappa. Eyewitness accounts in Japan date from the 1800s. These are hominid beings with webbed limbs and turtle-like carapaces. They're known to be tricksters to downright menacing and have been known to drown people in livestock with their sumo wrestling skills. Hot or not? Hot. Hot. Pretty hot. hot. Oh I'm man, that thing can push me good. out of the ring anytime. Good oh, hugger. Yeah. Good hugger. <laughs> yeah, I'd let him grab me. I know, me. Something's, something's kind of doing it for me here. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, according to legend, the Kappa's favorite meal is the Japanese eggplant. No, I'm not making that up. <laughs> 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 Have you seen Shape of the Water? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of slimy. I don't know. Anyone else? Just me? Okay. Yeah. It's got that crotch bulge. You can see it kind of 
Yeah, it's got that, that Chad big, big crotch bulge. It also yeah. has yeah, kind of like a, like a monk haircut. I don't know what's it going It does, there. yeah. That's actually, so it has a dish on its head <laughs> that it uses to like carry water with it because if it huh. gets dehydrated, then it like shrivels and dies. Whoa. So That's they're usually under, they're usually found in like ponds and lakes and stuff, but they can occasionally be outside of the water if they carry water in that dish. But if it runs out, then, you know. Wow. I mean, same. I also have to stay hydrated. It's just it's relatable. Thinking, thinking you know, ahead. It's kind of sexy. <laughs> yeah. Number four on our list today, the Wendigo. Ooh, <laughs> I'm just yeah. going to say hot right now. You don't right have now. to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this is your type. It's giving me a feeling. All right. All right. So the Wendigo is spotted in the cold and remote regions of Canada and the northern United States. It is 15 feet tall, emaciated to the point of decay, and sometimes appears with a stag's head, but sometimes not. According to First Nations tribes, a Wendigo is created when a hunter resorts to cannibalism due to starvation. Mm. It is known to imitate human voices to lure people into the woods and devour them. Man. Hot or Whoa. not? That's a no for me. Yeah, I gotta yeah. go with no. Gonna, gonna it plays no? mind games. Like it's always yeah. concerned about its weight. Yeah, it's got. <laughs> I mean, you, you you don't want. I mean, it just you don't you but want it, you want but it has it a not deer taking head. care of itself. Pretty, it those of us who are looking to be devoured on a regular basis, this is pretty great. Yeah, it's got a, <laughs> and look at that look at that grin. It's beautiful. Yeah. I don't know. No, I, I mean, gotta say, this is this is all a very personal decision. What might be hot mm -hmm. for one person might not be hot for another person. And I'm just gonna have to go with not. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and you know <laughs> it's <laughs> so, as as a resident of the northern United States and an avid wilderness backpacker. There's one thing that keeps me in the tent at night. I will hold my pee all night long. And it's not bears. I'm not afraid of bears. But they're kind of like big, scary dogs. I'm scared that I will leave the tent and I will retreat, you know, a safe distance into the darkness to do my business. And then I'll hear the voice of my husband, which is weird because I'm pretty sure he was still in the tent. I'll hear the voice of my husband calling out for help. And maybe he fell down the ravine. Maybe he dropped his headlamp or something. But I can't not go see if he's okay, right? So it's basically like that scene from Annihilation. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so there's nothing less hot than being devoured alive in the North Cascades on what should have been a fun and relaxing camping trip. On to our final lesser known cryptid, the Fresno Nightcrawler. Ooh. Is that just two legs? <laughs> yes. 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 Don't ball. forget about the ass. Okay, <laughs> done. We're, we're, we're absolutely captured done. This on is film it. in Fresno, California and Yosemite <laughs> National Park. It's approximately four feet tall, a nocturnal biped with a short upper body and gray skin. Park rangers in Yosemite actually spotted an adult Fresno nightcrawler with smaller young. And Whoa. this is all on video too. You can look this shit up. Um, hot or not. Wait, when was recently? Like this year or like this decade? I think like 2011 or something. Like wow. pretty recently as far as cryptid sightings go. Yeah. I would say oh, absolutely dude. hot. Yeah, I'm hot. going hot. Dude, look at the size of that donk. Mm. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> You're right, guys. It is hot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Look, we got we got all <laughs> we got all that ass. <laughs> Hope you like long romantic walks. <laughs> <Keep going. laughs> Literally, just by, like, if you if you see seriously, look up the videos of the Fresno Nightcrawler because in all the videos, it's just like it's just vibing. It's just like you know crossing the the plane of sight and like. Yeah, just like really feeling itself. So I find that kind of confidence pretty sexy. How was the Fresno Nightcrawlers like not their like minor league baseball team yet? Oh man. <laughs> That's a great idea. I would wear that hat. Oh hell yeah. Fresno Nightcrawlers. Maybe, they, maybe they're just pants. Maybe they just like <laughs> Who needs to make just a, a logo. Pair of white pants. That That's actually team. one of the theories of the videos is that um it's just somebody like somehow puppeting a pair of like white pants. Dude, it's well, the it's trousers like from Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the right trousers. Am I right? <laughs> they end up in Fresno. Too with the Fresno Nightcrawler is it's the it's a cryptid that's interesting because 
it's one of the first that there's more video footage of it than there is actual eyewitnesses. Like mm-hmm. way more people have caught it on film than have actually seen it in person or claim to have. Wait, yeah, how does that work? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, like it, the cameras are rolling, like like surveillance cameras? It kind of makes sense, yeah. It's mostly surveillance cameras. Um, yeah. There was this guy, it's usually, um, like actually, you know, the, uh, the Yosemite park rangers caught it on like park cameras. And this photo, I think, is from a surveillance like parking garage in Fresno. Um, I guess it just comes out at night and like you I'm know goes on long romantic walks. Wow! So that's my list, everybody. Hell yeah! I will now I be taking that. questions yes. from the audience. I love that. Well, I, I just want to give a shout out to everyone on YouTube that's been voting on all of these cryptids. They were mm. voting. That's wonderful. Yeah. <clears throat> did they did they um how many people got them right <laughs> yeah yeah can we do some shout out <laughs> the correct answer uh, you know people have got their own tastes obviously like yeah, there was there's not, not consensus yeah well, all I right love, that's my i love that so much eva thank you so much all right should i should i spin in the wheel. Wheels running out of residence, though. Just like a slasher flick, one by one, they go down. All right. Does that mean two blue next to each other? Uh, I did not design it. <clears throat> okay. Wheel of morality. Oh, that's right on the line. Uh, that's oh All right. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Okay, I'm gonna put my AirPods back in. Oh, is that? Did How I do you have the great. ability to resize my window? That's amazing. Can y'all hear me all right? I don't know, man. It's yeah, all magic. I can hear you. Yeah. Oh cool. 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 Um. All right. So my name is Camilla. Um. I am an artist. I live in Utah. I know some of you from Twitter and others of you. Hello, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> so I'll just get into it. This this part's always weird. So I'll just, uh, about a year ago, I found myself turning into a desert prophet. You know, like um, we got that. Isaiah, we've got Muhammad, we've got Muad'Dib, you know, being a, living in the desert, you just kind of just you end up kind of turning into a prophet, right? So this uh, was a thing that started happening to me as well. Um, and, uh, you know, as a, as a desert prophet, I have to, uh, hold on a second, there we go. As a desert prophet, I've got to be proclaiming the message of the desert God, all right? So um, what is the message of the desert God? Uh, in my case, um, I feel very compelled to, uh, talk about the law of action and consequence, specifically when it comes to what we are doing to our planet. Um, The great thing about the natural world is uh, if we F it up, it's gonna F us up too. Um, So, you know, the more carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere, the more heat gets trapped in the atmosphere, the stronger storms and hurricanes and tornadoes get and the more our crops die and everything. And it's all just kind of like, well, you get what you deserve, right? Um, and another fun thing is uh, that um, a lot of the uh, um, effects of climate change look like biblical apocalyptic prophecy. So the sun being darkened, the moon being turned to blood uh, from from pollution, uh, stars falling from their places. You know, you could either go a space debris route uh, or a um, World War Three satellite. I don't know. My dad over Christmas decided to spend like an hour telling us about how World War Three is is going to be fought in space, and I was like, okay, whatever, Dad. Like um, space force. You know, <laughs> I guess um, something about killer satellites. I don't know. I was just trying to make him shut up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't stop talking about it. Um, the seas heaving beyond their bounds, you know. Uh, as the ice caps melt. New York's gonna be underwater, sorry about it. I live in Utah. Um, the earth's shaking. I don't know if you guys know, but fracking, which is uh, 
when you get natural gas out of the earth by pumping high pressure uh, water underneath it can cause earthquakes potentially. And then of course the classic men's hearts failing them. I think we can look at any current events these days to see that uh, hmm, people maybe aren't being as integritous as they could be. So um, I had plans, you know, I was ready to proclaim this message. Um, I wrote a little zine of, of poetry and art. Um, and I had this big plan that I was gonna do this week. Uh, so it's Earth Day this Wednesday and um, there's a big climate protest that was gonna happen in Salt Lake the theme was funeral for the earth. And I was gonna dress up as the desert prophet with my skull mask and everything. And I was gonna have a big old sign that said, repent for the end is nigh. And it was gonna be great. And you know, I was gonna be in the newspaper and it was, I mean, maybe if I got lucky, it was gonna be amazing. But then ugh, the wrong apocalypse happened. I was so prepared for the other apocalypse and then a pandemic that, that wasn't part of my plan. So pretty upset. Do you guys know how annoying it is to spend like a year preaching that the wrong apocalypse is going to happen? It's completely <laughs> Oh my gosh, I was not happy about it. Um, but you know, Desert Prophet's got to do what Desert Prophet's got to do. Um, and what Desert Prophet's do best is, uh, you know, preaching about an apocalypse. So I was like, all right, I can work with this. I can change tack. So I did end up dressing up as a Desert Prophet and... Um, <laughs> protesting people playing frisbee in the park so you know do what you can um i love a good you know call to repentance of course um yeah so so that's my tale about how i predicted the wrong apocalypse um i'm writing a graphic novel right now about the desert prophet so if you thought this was fun you can follow me on twitter and instagram and also i've made a couple of zines as the desert prophet um that i released through my weird mormon art collective which is called the archive so anyways, um, that's everything for me. Thank you for listening. Yeah, that was awesome. Thanks, Camilla. Good. Yay. Wait, can you leave that up? Oh yeah, sorry. That was really, yeah, that's awesome. Wait, so are you, so you're not the desert prophet. You're just embodying okay. the desert prophet sometimes. Uh, hold on a second. I'm having some computer trouble. I'm going to check on my son real quick, who is just playing PlayStation, which is what he always does. But I want to make sure he's doing OK. I'll be right back. Um, I, I would say I am the Desert Prophet. OK. Mm, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's just like Richard's a time scanner. You know, yeah, it's, that's great. It's, it's a thing. It's part of my life. Yeah. What is, uh, and what is the arc archive? So. I am one of the co-founders of a weird Mormon art collective called The Archive, because Mormonism is weird as hell, but we like, we love it. So basically it's just like me and my friends who make weird Mormon art. Um, I have a friend who does vaporwave Mormon art collages. Whoa, um, that yeah. makes sense though. I, I mean like space uses. It's sick. Yeah. I can show you. I mean, um, my boyfriend's making a video game that's a text-based adventure set underneath Salt Lake. It's like a Lovecraftian Wow, thing. oh my gosh, um, this is amazing yeah um it's pretty it's pretty good it's it's pretty much my favorite thing uh, i'll show you my buddy laseros he's an anonymous artist which i know some of you guys definitely get <clears throat> definitely get um <laughs> yeah so me and me and laseros aka mormcore is there just like <laughs> a bunch of stupid mormon inside jokes that like oh man they're so good though i don't know it's just like aesthetically <laughs> they're awesome Wow. And then if you know anything about Utah, it's uh I, it's even more I love Utah and Salt Lake. So. I think it's the fascinating. Wait, who's part. talking right now? Oh me, Sam. Oh hello. I spent an extremely limited amount of time in Salt Lake, but I think it's awesome. Wait, me what is too. that? <laughs> what is that? Wait, what's the pure all Deseret thing? What does that say? Oh, this Green one? Deseret? Okay, so yeah, yeah. How do you know? Oh, amazing. So there's this <laughs> if if those of you who don't know. There's this alternate alphabet called the Desert Alphabet that Brigham Young like commissioned back in the 1800s. But um, this was for an art show we just did um, where we did Mormon versions of the Catholic Stations of the Cross for Easter. Um, and uh, it says CE to it, which is what Pilate says when he washes his hands of like Christ's uh, whatever, when he says, go ahead and kill him or whatever. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, it's 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 pretty great. Uh, here's a good one: Joseph Smith's Pro Revelator. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Wait, oh, that's real? No. Oh, I didn't, I didn't make it up, and I was like, oh, I thought you did make it. Well, up. yeah, I mean, he did make it up, but <laughs> this is also he made this uh, for a pop up show I did. This oh, doesn't so cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, follow my boy, Laseros. Um, he's really great. Um, he's on Twitter too, if you right. want some weird Mormon content. And then my, my art collective is called The Archive. Right. Um, I'm terrible at posting on the social media because I have too many social medias, but That's I don't so know cool. if you live in Utah, which I don't think any of you do. We like, when we're not under quarantine, we do meetups like once a month. And uh, I don't know, we, like, we make a bunch of zines and we have a couple of cassette tapes and uh, I don't know. It's just fun. This is awesome. Like, well, yeah, what are our zines? Really this one's cool. all in Deseret. This is a Desert Prophet one. This is a bunch of parody brands by Laseros. This is a newspaper from Alternate Provo. This is another one I did where it's like, what? How do I describe? It's um, folk magic spells based on common tropes and Mormon prayers. And then there's two more. I have to update this website, but we have one uh, which is poems from a sca- space cowboy. And then one called that my sister did called, oh, what is it called? It's Wait, called, the Space Cowboy of Joshua Tree, California? No, no. Is there a Space Cowboy of Joshua Tree, California? Oh, no, this cowboy one's book. like a, no, this one is just Space Cowboy on, I don't, what are the weirdest Mormonism things? I don't even know if I can go into this. I mean, I can, but like, I don't know if I want to. Um, just the dirt. The weird, give us give us the really weird stuff yeah yeah, yeah. so um i can't even remember where this came from but something about a planet called Kolob, which is like the closest to where god lives i don't really know it's a vibe um but this is a poem from a space cowboy in the new old west on Kolob. my friend grant made it uh, and then my sister did one called a book i wrote about god and the time i yelled at him to please go talk to my boyfriend so <laughs> <laughs> yeah basically it's just a bunch of explorations of like i don't know being a religious person is super weird in this day and age especially when your religion is really weird already and so we're like let's just vibe with it and like utah's weird mormonism's weird let's just own it and like that's so great, great. so yeah that's my weird life <laughs> excellent Love every bit of it cool. thank you so much oh yeah thank you All right, should we spin the wheel again? Spin the spin wheel. The wheel. <clears throat> okay, is that it? Or remain. Nick, Yule, Sam, and Liminal Earth. Do we, am I missing anyone? Okay. I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Liminal Earth. It's me. You're up, Jeremy. Ba-bow. All right, I Let watched I watched here. some of your uh, live stream the other night. Oh, you I did? Was, yeah, yeah. I was watching it on my phone, and my phone ran out of batteries. But I watched a good chunk of it. Oh, good. Yeah. What did you think? It was great. Yeah. I mean, it was a it, lot of fun. You, you and you and Garrett are awesome. So I I love to hear you guys talk. Go oh, for thank it. Thank you. All right. So let's see here. I'm going to share my screen. Where are you, my slideshow? There you are. All right, can you see it? Yes. Yes. Cool. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk today about the four principles of liminal cartography. I'm gonna give a little background on it as well. Um, So my uh, associate Garrett, who unfortunately couldn't be here this evening, and I uh, are members of the Society for Liminal Cartography, um, which is actually an ancient and arcane society. It stretches back to the days of ancient Quatria. Um, that's that's another slideshow entirely. So I'm not going to go too much into that, um, but I did want to sort of give you an overview of like what we're doing and what we're trying to do. Uh, and for aspiring liminal cartographers, which I think everybody is actually an aspiring liminal cartographer, they just don't know it yet. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and give you some foundations uh, to, to go ahead and get started for yourselves. All right, let's see here. So Liminal Earth, an online repository of strangeness. Liminal.Earth 
what we do is we map uh, strange, weird, unusual, and paranormal stories. Uh, we've got stories all over the world. Um, most of them are in the United States. We started off as Luminal Seattle, um, but there was so much interest in this idea that um, we opened it up to the whole world. So. Basically, you visit the site, you see the map, you can browse through it, you can browse through it by uh, type, by um, you could browse through it by location, you can click on each of those icons and it'll bring up the, the story that's related to it. And um, the most important thing is that anybody who visits the site can submit their own story, and we'll just put it on the map. So. This is the legend. These are the kind of things that we put on the map. So uh, dark forces. So that would be accounts of lanyard zombies, drones, corporate death zones, cupcake shops, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, here in Seattle, we have those <laughs> giant Amazon balls, the Bezos balls. Those are definitely on there as a dark force, uh, but also lesser <laughs> dark forces like, you know, demonic entities that possess people and stuff. The things that aren't as serious as Amazon, but uh, they're so on there too. You, for the non-Seattleites, what is a Bezos ball? So uh, Amazon has <laughs> downtown, Amazon has this, um, basically it's these giant, uh, gosh, balls. how do you even describe them? Yeah, they're balls, but they're like greenhouses. Oh, and this, it, is like, like, this is glass like the corporate headquarters greenhouse thing. sphere. Yeah, it's like Amazon headquarters and you can go in and like, you can see they have all these tropical plants everywhere and they're just like pouring, you know, millions and millions and millions and that's of dollars. That's where the Amazon went. <laughs> yeah, basically, exactly, yeah. But, but there's oh, meeting no. rooms there for the employees and you know the public has to make an appointment and anyhow, they're just these big giant balls. So the Bezos balls. Thank you. Um, so we also have, uh, we feature time distortions. So um, I've even time scanner, the time scanner has uh, one or one or two entries, a couple. Yeah, yeah, I've submitted a handful of things to you yeah. guys, including yeah. uh, Cookie Conspiracy, which is one of my favorite ones. But anyway, go yes. on. Yes, yes, that's right. Oh, yeah, I just so remembered, I have a time traveler or yeah, a time traveler portal thing that I saw in Santa Fe I need to post. Yeah, do yeah, it, do, do it, it. Do it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so yeah, travelers, time hunters, deja vu, losing time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also allow for mythologies. So pre-shamanic deer cults, radical Gnostic animism. We've got like a sighting of Odin on there. Um, you know, anything that sort of falls outside of the, uh, the, the paranormal box could fit there. Uh, cryptoids, so Bigfoot, uh, but also, uh, you know, werewolves, trolls, ogres, et cetera. Um, thin places would be, you know, strange places that you get to go to, ley lines, uh, plant sigils, portals. Um, of course, we have straight up ghosts, which is, you know, ghost stories. <laughs> um, then we have uh, high weirdness, which, you know, is sort of as catch all for everything that doesn't fit within the other categories. We've got classic UFOs, uh, which is self explanatory. Uh, strange animals, so, you know, crow sightings, um, unusual encounters, fecal divination. So some people believe that like if a bird poops on you in a certain uh, way or location, it'll actually uh, tell you something about um, your future. And then we also have an account of uh, so visions, dreams, mystical experience, etc. So we encourage everybody from around the world to come and uh, put their story on the map, filter it into one or more of these categories. Um, and then we're sort of eventually hoping to track, you know, trends or collect the strangest stories of all. And we have uh, well, about a 450 entries right now um, and we're getting submissions every day. So check it out. So now I'll talk about the four principles of liminal cartography itself, uh, which are sort of the foundation of how we view the map. Number one, respect the mystery. I'm just gonna list them and then I'll go through each one individually. Number two, be nice to entities. Number three, normalize the paranormal. And finally, number four, remythologize the landscape. Respect mystery, nice to entities, normalize the paranormal, remythologize the landscape. I made this 10 minutes ago too, and like just sort of threw <laughs> like weird effects into it. So well, you yours know. is beautiful. There we go. <laughs> oh, they threw the wave. That's a good one. I hope there's another one out there. I'm not, I'm not done. Oh. All right. Oh, you want me to go back? You want me to see those again? Yeah, it's okay. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Respect the mystery. We all like <laughs> Scooby Doo. I mean, everybody likes Scooby Doo, but Scooby Doo in most of the incarnations was like a total bummer um, mm -hmm. for a lot of us because you know it was never like a real monster at the end. Um, but 
my my son and I were watching. The, it was like a Scooby Doo show from like 2010, a while ago, and they had this whole sequence where Scoob went into the Black Lodge, um, and the little man from another place was there. And uh, so, if you haven't seen, this is a Twin Peaks like classic Twin Peaks uh, reference. And uh, the the guy who actually voiced, uh, who was the little man on Twin Peaks, did the voice uh, here. And I just thought like. That's what it's about, really. It's respecting the mystery. Like Scooby Doo couldn't actually solve what was going on in the Black Lodge, um, and we shouldn't be so ready to try to solve what was going on uh, in other people's accounts. So when Wait, people Scooby speak backwards in the Black Lodge, also yes, yes, he does. <laughs> right. You can look up the Rob, videos online. Rob's it is Scooby team there, and this isn't it. There's like there's a good solid twenty minutes of like Black Lodge, uh, Black Lodge stuff in this in like two episodes of this show oh uh, not to derail you but which uh which scooby was this this was uh, uh, i think it was like mystery incorporated yes. or something oh like my that. god this yeah this was actually awesome i yes, highly it was recommend really it. really good it yeah. was it was weird i i mean yeah. i only watched it because i had a kid but um but it was like phenomenal yeah they do like ancient alien theory in it and yeah they like, get into all like kinds of like lovecraftian stuff yeah, it's great. Yeah, highly recommended. Definitely. Uh, yeah, nope, not a problem. So, <laughs> the uh, we want to be more like Scoop here and and respect the mystery. So when people uh, send us reports, we never ask whether or not it's true or false. Um, you know, if something is is obviously fake, then we might kind of go, eh, there's somebody trying to pull our leg. But what for the most part, like? what does obviously fake look like? You know, um. I don't know. We haven't even had any. <laughs> we pretty much accepted everything except like a couple that were, there was one that was, um, somebody was like mysteriously peeing on the floor in the bathroom. That's pretty mysterious. Yeah. So we didn't take that one, but we have okay, some. But was there the floating tub Toblerone? Was that? Yeah. Yeah. There's a floating real? Toblerone. Yeah. That was real. Oh, yeah. As far as people know. I mean, everything that well, we don't know, like actually it's not up to to us to make that determination. We want to honor the experiencer. And so like, because in our, our opinion, like all of these accounts are either true or false. Uh, we already know that, but what's important to us is like, how is this impacting the person who had the experience? That's what's interesting to us. So we want to respect the mystery. We don't try to debunk or disprove anything. Um, the next one is be nice to entities. I don't know if any of uh, the uh, listeners here are into paranormal shows or anything like that, but like they're always trying to like cast out the demons or like hunt the monsters or these like ghost bros will come in and they'll be like, we're going to cast you out. We're just wondering like, why can't we be nice to entities instead? Because he's not just staring into your soul. Mothman might be looking for a friend. Yes, Aww. and I will be his friend. You know, I mean, so why are we going to like go in and investigate this stuff with the idea that you know these these terrible things that we need to get rid of? He looks and like we could soft. just be friends with them. Also, for the re record, Mothman, hot, hot, absolutely, hot. very hot. You have a crush hot. on Mothman, actually. Absolutely. And so we know here um, that that this ghost. Ghosts, um, you know, they have intrinsic characteristics. All of these entities have intrinsic characteristics. So more investigating entity reports, we need to take their needs in mind before we decide we want to like destroy them, get rid of them or cast them out somehow or exercise them. Um, so we we totally recommend for people who are encountering these things to do an intrinsic characteristics analysis, which is typically used in permaculture landscape design to determine which plants you should put in your landscape. Um, but we feel as though it actually also has value when you're discussing paranormal entities. Next, we want to normalize the paranormal. Um, this is a picture of Anthor. Uh, he's a pre, uh, prehistoric deer deity, and he's emerging from the hypogeum. Hot. And, uh, Absolutely. And so some of you are, may, may already have, have encountered Anthor. Um, you know, he's definitely one of the main, uh, the main powers in the, the Quatrian pantheon. And what we're talking about is the idea of like a, um, a prehistoric deer deity who emerges from an underground chamber on a semi-regular basis, depending on how the planets are aligned, should be considered like a totally normal thing. I mean, People tend to freak out when they hear that you're into something paranormal. They think you're like weird or crazy. Um, but we think that like the more outlandish it is, uh, the more we want to normalize that because 
it makes life more interesting. Not only that, but one of the things we've learned from this map thing to get away from the Anthor thing is um, everybody who we've talked to has had some kind of strange experience. Like we've, we, we table at events and um, even at the non-paranormal events that we've tabled at, like people come up and they're like, oh, um, I, I never had any normal experience. Events. Yeah, exactly. Um, people have said like, oh, I, uh, I've had this weird experience, um, or no, you, you ask them, like, have you had a weird experience? Have you seen anything strange or unusual? And half the time, the response is no, no, I've never seen anything weird or had an unusual experience. Oh, wait, except when this happened. So it's actually really, really common for people to have paranormal or strange experiences. Um, and we're trying to open up a space for people to share those without being called crazy or, you know, dumb or, or silly or et cetera. All right. Is this the next thing we want to talk about is remythologizing the landscape. I'm going to spend the most time on this because it's the most important one. So Garrett and I and our sons um, went on this quest for something called the Screaming Well. And the Screaming Well is supposedly this well somewhere on the outskirts of Seattle that uh, screams. And if you find it and you look down to it and you listen to it, you'll hear the screaming of people who have fallen into it and they might, the voices might follow you home. So, but nobody knows where this thing is. So I'm like, I really want to find this thing, right? So uh, we've, been, we've been doing research on where the screaming well could possibly be. And we haven't been able to track it down, but on one of our expeditions, we went way back into the woods and we saw all these like signs of um, like folkloric fairies, like uh, flowers that were special to the fairies and like hawthorn trees in bloom and stuff. And then on the way out, we came out and at the trailhead, we saw this guy, right? And he looked at us with these goggles on and our two sons and he said, hey, you guys want to go flying with me? <laughs> we were yes. like, what? Yeah. So. Hot or not. So he opened up his <laughs> trunk. <laughs> yeah. His trunk and he's actually got drones in his trunk, like four drones. And he's got these goggles and he had like four pairs of goggles, like just enough for all of us um, so that each of us could like put on these goggles and he flew the drones around and like we could look through the camera uh, and it was like VR flying through these drones. And so we were thinking like, oh, that's really cool. That was kind of a fun experience to have. But then when we got home and we started thinking about it from a, a folkloric context, we just walked into the woods and came out and we were at a crossroads and a mysterious man wearing strange devices taught us how to fly <laughs> <laughs> yes that is direct, like straight out of like all of the folkloric lore about meeting interesting mm -hmm. entities in the woods so we now have this mythology about this guy and his name actually uh, we've we've called him the drone gnome <laughs> <laughs> he's still out there somewhere you know we don't know we've never actually tracked him down but the drone gnome is out there and he'll teach you to fly the other thing about remythologizing landscape um, is that you know, doing liminal cartography and going out into the field, you start to learn in a sort of a different, um, a different way to, you, you start to see things differently. Um, so, you know, we have tools like other people use like those box, those ghost boxes. Um, we use dowsing rods, um, but one of the things we use is, is these, um, I'll hold them up so you can see them. These are hagstone binoculars. So a hagstone is a, a stone with a, a hole in the middle. And if you look through it, you're supposedly able to see like the other side. So we found one and we taped it some binoculars. And so we're learning how to see uh, into liminal spaces. That's now on the, on the side, what? That's extremely it's cool. Just it's so, yeah, oh, it's so that's fun. totally they, dope. They work. Um, so the, the, the comparison that we like to make um, in particular, because we're also all plant people, is that seeing, um, like learning to see the liminal in order to make maps of it, and investigate it is similar to learning about um, all of the different species of plants that are around you. Um, there's this thing called plant blindness. We don't like the blindness thing because it's a little ableist, but we call it plant awareness, where this is the landscape that you would normally see when you're walking. This is a picture of my wife and our dog. Um, and you might see like, this is a girl and this is a good boy and this is the road and this is the forest. But when you learn all the plants that are around you, um, it's like putting on like a heads up display and instead, when I'm looking at this scene, this is what I see. Mm. So all of the different plants, all of their uses, did the dog pee on them? Like if the road is well-traveled, is there dust there? 
Um, it's it's like a way of looking at the landscape um, that is totally different than sort of the average way to look at the landscape. It's like putting on uh, a set of goggles and all of a sudden this entire world of like cool nature facts opens up to you. So I think that like learning plant ID locally is like one of the best ways to get into liminal cartography um, and just it's fun in general. Uh, but that's a, like one of our favorite comparisons is uh, the difference between the picture I just showed and this. Is nipple wart real? Nipple wart is real. Nipple wart is uh, it's an edible plant. It was actually used, uh, they extracted oil from it uh, in the Roman era, and it excretes a, a um, latex that was used to soothe the aching nipples of breastfeeding women. Far out. It's a good one to know. Uh, also, when you remythologize re the landscape, you can start realizing that uh, everything that you think as far as paranormal experiences may not be what they seem. Um, why are UFOs not considered actually part of a life cycle of something? Perhaps the cryptids that you see in the woods actually are in a larval stage and eventually will become something else as they continue their growth period. Uh, other things that we like to think about is why, if there are so many ghosts of humans, uh, why don't you ever hear about ghost flies or ghost spiders? Like maybe the sensation you're feeling on your arm and you, you're like, oh, I feel like something's crawling on me. It could be a ghost spider. You might have killed a spider. It might be haunting you. So all of these are different tools that we use to remythologize the landscape as we build our liminal maps. Uh, finally, in order to normalize the paranormal, we encourage you come to a liminal earth, submit your story, liminal.earth slash submit. Um, you're also uh, welcome just to come to our site and browse around a, a bit. We have lots of fun things to see. Uh, we have an ambassador program for different people. We have about uh, 10 ambassadors from around the world right now uh, helping us collect these reports. So if you are interested in liminal cartography, um, don't hesitate to get out there and remythologize your landscape. And uh, that's it. Any questions? Yeah. That's great. Thank you, Jeremy. Loved that. that I really awesome. enjoyed that. That was great. I don't have a question, but I do have a similar experience to your drone gnome. Really? Oh my God. Are I you thinking of the same person that I am? I'm sure I am. Yeah. So the guy in the I, woods? Yeah. A few, a few years back. I was going to say Eva the same thing. I, it was, a, it was a, like a kind of a drizzly weekend and we were kind of cooped up. It was like early spring, maybe late winter. And we, we just kind of like wanted to get out. So we we drove to a like a really short day hike on the uh, east slope of the Olympics, and we were like the whole point of it was to see like beautiful waterfalls because of all the rain that was going on and all the like the mosses and just just everything a beautiful landscape. And we were like the only ones out there just because of the time of year. Um, we were hiking around, we were doing our thing. Uh, we stopped and like you know had a snack, threw a stick for the dog, smoked some weed, and um, we were you know doing our thing and decided to pack up and leave. And as we were leaving, we came across like an old man and a young boy. And the old man, uh, you know, I, I, I say like, hello. And the old man says like, hello, have you found any out here? And Eva and I look at each other and say, found any what? And he goes, oh, and then just walks away. <laughs> I was going to bring up the exact same story because that man was looking for something. Oh Dude, my gosh. He was, he was we we talked about it for the entire walkout. Next, you should submit it to our say, map. Next yeah. time just say, oh yeah, but you show us yours first. <laughs> <laughs> it was right there. Oh, you should totally put that on our map. That's exactly yeah. the time we're looking at. I we have that. like crazy like the the we even would like if a dog was wearing a dog wearing shoes sighting that would be like that would be incredible i mean that's dog kind of wearing magical, shoes. let's yes, be honest please. Yeah. yes i uh i once saw someone who didn't have a face who laughed at me in three voices <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's definitely map worthy totally yeah. map worthy. absolutely <laughs> do you want to go into that anymore nate who here has who oh. here has seen ufo Raise your hands. I have seen, well, my mom um, has. Possibly. Possibly. I have, I have a very real ghost experience, but my UFO experiences are questionable. Yeah. I have Richard, a UFO. You're, 
experience oh, from when I was eight that I immediately debunked the next day because I realized <laughs> I was on a slope and I was actually looking down at the water and saw a boat. <laughs> uh. <laughs> UFO, unidentified floating object. There you go. <laughs> Never a yeah. UFO experience, but I've, I've certainly had like a uh, ghost experience sort of thing. We should yeah. do another one where we just tell our ghost stories. I, I would agree. love that. I, can we please yeah. do a ghost edition All of this? Yeah, yeah, and you can we can have like the YouTube like log burning in the fire as oh, our... hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> do it. one of the squares on our Zoom is just like a nice <laughs> back on the fire. I'd be happy to dig up some weird tales from the road. A lot of yeah, we could we could get oh, a man. bunch of them, the weirdest ones from the map and just read them. Ooh, that'd yeah, be that'd be actually. awesome. Yep. Well, I'm like, sure. Like, yeah, Yule Yule has lots of weird stories. I think so. A lot of time yeah. moving from place to place and weird stuff starts to become mundane because it just keeps happening. But it's the way it is. Uh, should we spin the wheel? Any more questions for Jeremy? No. Spin the wheel. Spin, spin the, wheel. the wheel. 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 Um, I got to dip out, guys. My mom okay. keeps calling me, but thank you so much for All having right. me. Yeah. Bye. I hope your mom's you. okay. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming, Callie. I'm this trying to wave, but I just lose my arms. Um, <laughs> right, I know. <laughs> I too am going to do the same thing. Uh, uh, okay. it's, it is bedtime. I have to put the little one away. So I get it. Yes. Thank well, you thank very you so much, much for, for having joining me. us. It was so good yeah, to see you. you. It was nice about. to see a lot of your faces in motion and not just in pictures. <laughs> Without revealing <laughs> your own. Exactly. Well, thank you very much. You'll have a good rest of the evening. You thank too. you, Mountain. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. So now we're down to Sam, Nick, and Yule. And then there were three. I was going to make that joke. Dang, look at those primary colors. Dang, I thought my number was up. Go. I'm waiting for the confetti. Perfect. Yeah. Ooh. I'm so right. sorry. I'm, I'm going to be right back. But All right. Do you want us to vamp for you until you come back? By right back, I mean I'm going to eat a meal and then come right back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'll be on the third o'clock. Um, right how do I... Wait, did it pick? I thought it picked me. Did it pick? It did. Yeah, it's, it it's did, you. Yeah. I see it's still spinning. Okay, weird. Oh, I think. Are oh, we looking at YouTube? I just yeah, I realized I was looking at YouTube by accident. Yeah, that's confusing. Okay, where's? How do I um? Do you? How do you want to do this? Do you want to? Do I like rest control of the of the uh, thing? So oh, you yeah. can you can take over. There's a button at the oh, bottom. Oh, share screen. Share Got screen, it. and then you can choose what you what you. Got it. Show. Okay. Let me just. Uh, how do I? I like the idea of resting control. Like it's <laughs> <best>. yeah. <laughs> Wait. What happened? Is that? No, that's not. Oh shoot. Sorry. I'm trying to. That's I don't fine. do a lot of slide decks. I'm not one of people who even calls them like decks. You know. Um, how do I, oh, present, that's what I want. Hey, okay, cool. I think, <sighs> yeah, whenever you're ready, you do share. Oh, you got it, you got it. Cool, all right. Um, oh, but actually I need to see, if I'm over here, you can't see my script, right? I don't we can see only script. see the, uh, the, the orange. Okay, yep. is that right? Okay, and I go back and forth, like, okay, cool. Um, okay, so I'm Sam Greenspan. Um, I am a radio and podcast producer. Um, and, um, I, for the last like three years have been developing a show called Bellwether, which is, um, reporting true stories from a sci-fi, um, uh, frame, but, um, and it's sort of become this thing that's like taken forever to get out. <clears throat> and, um, I just felt like I needed to like, had needed this outlet, um, to sort of like make kind of like more zine stuff. Um, and work out some ideas really quickly. And so I've been working for the last couple of weeks, I've been, I started a project called Talk Group, which is a new podcast that I don't really even know how to define, but, um, but uh, it's, at, it's at talkgroup.us, it's on, it's on the, the, the feeds. And this is a sort of like working through some ideas that was gonna be for the next episode. Um, and kind of a different tone. So I think I kind of maybe missed the uh, irreverent, uh, not that not that not that cryptids are irreverent by any means, but <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm gonna start. Variety's good. Variety's good. It's a variety show. All right. So in 1976, Headlands Press of San Francisco published an oversized manual uh, of a book called The New Games Book. 
Um, the book outlines directions for games, new games. For small groups, there's Fraha and Schmerz and Tweezle Wop. Um, and, uh, and new Frisbee. For large groups, there's Orbit and Hug Tag and new Volleyball. Accompanying the text are black and white photos of people all assembled in a field enacting these games. The crowd looks very characteristically Berkeley of the 1970s, flower prints, cut off shorts, lots of afros, few bras. Um, the, oh shoot, I just lost my place. Uh, so the new games described in the New Graham's book are, they're field games, essentially, they're camp games. Um, games for people to play with their whole bodies. Uh, the introduction describes that the impetus for this games was that activists in the 1960s and 70s often had such an unhealthy relationship with their bodies from carrying around the stress of all of the uh, resistance and anti-war work they were doing. And also as New Games co-founder Stuart Brand, yes, that's Stuart Brand, um, also asked uh, if not, if pacifists shouldn't also be opposed to all forms of competition, which is why um, the subtitle of the New Games book reads, play hard, play fair, nobody hurt. The games are inherently non-competitive. So Fraha, for instance, which is what we have, oh, I think I went that past it. So Fraha um, is a game where two people use paddles to bat a ball back and forth, the goal being to see how you, long you can keep it going. And the directions read, quote, you and your partner are both competing against the universe's seemingly insatiable appetite for disorder. In New Frisbee, um, players do score points, but, um, but uh, there's a caveat which says, quote, when the throw is good and the catcher makes a clean catch, no points are re received by either player. The perfection in the action is the reward in itself. And schmerlts is um, when you stick a softball into a tube sock and tie it off and then fling it in the air like a comet. The challenge is to catch it by the tail. And uh, hug tag is basically what it sounds like. Um, so I'm, what's next here? So, okay, so I'm, I don't actually know how I came into owning a copy of the new games book. I actually have it right here. Um, but um, for me, the draw isn't, the anti-competitive nature of it. I'm actually a pretty competitive person, at least in games that I care about <laughs> um, or, or have some chance of winning. Um, so, but the allure for me with these games is that there's, it creates this context for like doing wacky things with your bodies and like interacting with others in this, in this wacky way. But like, like if you want to be real about this, like the new games book is pretty goofy. Like if you look at all the photos, it's like, of course this was written by hippies from Berkeley. They were all probably on acid at the time. Um, it's hard not to be at least a little cynical about it. Um, and it's harder still, at least for me, to imagine getting 50 or a dozen or even just five people together to go play games like human pinball or Hagu or amoeba race. It's hard to imagine from proposing it to people and not, and at least half of them not thinking like it sounds like the dumbest shit they had ever heard of. <laughs> um, it's also hard not to imagine being embarrassed or disheartened to be told by people that you care about and like that they do not want to interact with you in that way, in their body with this way, or maybe even their own body or anybody's body in that way. Um, and so I still have never actually played any of these games. Um, I, bought the, I bought this book maybe seven years ago and I've come across the new games book every time that I've moved since then, which has been a lot in the last seven years. Um, every time I pack the book into yet another cardboard box to move it somewhere, I'd wonder if I'd ever actually get people together to play a game like this. Um, and, and so when I moved to Los Angeles in 2018, um, I started gathering a crew of people who are out as people who like games. Um, before everyone's schedules melted down, my friend Sasha and I had been planning to do some kind of game day for friends and their extended game friend networks. Um, and so I'd actually pulled the new games book off of the shelf and began flipping through it and wondering um, if maybe this was the time to try it out. I told Sasha about it, she seemed into it, and I wondered if maybe this would finally be the year of new games. Um, the book has been sitting on my dining room table for the past six weeks, almost every night when I'm eating dinner alone so far um, from everyone, I'm thumbing through the book. And the thing that I think is like, what the fuck is wrong with all of us? Like, what is wrong with our priorities that we don't use every waking moment we have to just like smash our bodies into other people's bodies? Um, I think about how all I wanna do is like, tie myself together in this tangled knot of sweaty bodies and like 
get elbowed in the ribs and like feel someone's head on my back and like feet getting stomped on by other feet. And like, I want to do this out in the Angeles National Forest or Joshua Tree or up in the Marin Headlands where the new gamers once played. And like, I wanna like feel the cool air coming through the windows at dusk on the car ride home with every seatbelt filled like it's that Nick Drake, uh, you know, song music uh, Volkswagen commercial. Uh -huh. um, so if the, oops, so if these, if these were the new games, our new new games now are like, we go on walks far apart from each other. We sit in a park far apart from each other. We go on, bar we go on bike rides being very careful not to get an accident and have to land in the hospital. We play games online, we connect through Zoom or by a house party, take work or workout or cardio classes on Instagram Live alone, but together, but alone. My friend Jackie described it like we're playing a game of planets, all of us bodies in space orbiting around one another, but repelling if we get too close. And so I'm left wondering what will be our post new new, what will be our life post new new games? Will we rush to the nearest field and tie ourselves in human knots and play hug tag and catch a schmaltz? Or, you know, will we go down dancing every single night and like rub our sweaty bodies on friends and strangers and all just get really slutty? Um, I hope so, but I'm not. That's my vote. Yeah, I hope so. I'm not sure. Um, and I'm not sure that the obvious outcome um, is that when this new normal becomes just normal, when our new, new games just become games. Um, what seems more likely than, than not, than, than you know, pressing our, our bodies against others is cementing this fear of being closer than six feet. Um, when Zoom workout classes become preferable to going to one IRL of like when your powdered milk starts tasting better than fresh out of the carton or the glass. Um, so my grandma, my last remaining grandparent lived through the great depression and she never really got over it for almost 40 years she lived in a small one bedroom condo and occupying a sizable percentage of the floor space on her porch was a deep freezer. And it was always packed with frozen meat and vegetables um, because an entire lifetime later, she could still not ever shake her fear of food scarcity. So um, four months ago, she actually had to move to an assisted living facility and that is now under lockdown. And so um, I hope one day that I will have grandkids and I hope that one day they don't have to keep reminding me that um, like it, what would happen on my slide here? That, sorry, one day I hope that I have grandkids and I hope that they don't have to keep reminding me that like it's okay to give them a hug. And that's it. Oh my gosh, that was beautiful. That was really, really something. That was good. I love that. And if you guys want to play any of those games, I'll bring the acid. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm 100% in. <laughs> Once this is all over, if this is all over in any meaningful way, then yeah, let's do that. Oh man, that's great. I love that. Thank you so much, Sam. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah. So um, that'll be episode, so that or something like it will be episode three of, uh, of Talk Group. So cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah and dope. anyone that hasn't checked out Bellwether yet, there's like one episode online. How many episodes yeah, are online? Right now. Uh, it's amazing. Um, it's like seriously, seriously cool. Um, like amazing journalism uh, and uh, told in like science fiction storytelling like like uh, what's the uh consequences really I, I should let you pitch your own show but like it's amazing you should totally yeah, thank you. um so, yeah so bellwether is a it's like i call it speculative journalism it's um so like i sam greenspan i'm reporting here in the present um but my podcast has been found in the future by um a human and uh his ai companion who are like sifting through the wreckage of the internet, trying to figure out like what happened to their world. And this all takes place in the largest city in North America, um, Phoenix, Arizona. And, uh, and, uh, and they have a whole like storyline with them. So each episode that I report is a fairly self-contained story that the first four episodes um, are all kind of about ways that like they're all about like collisions between humans and complex information systems in ways that we don't understand. Um, and, but they're all kind of like, so they're thematically linked, but they're all separate, but they're sort of this like long arc of the, of the sci-fi world as it unfolds. So um, it's been, I'm like, like I had literally just started um, some negotiations on like a, 
on a on some very big machinations for it when like COVID nineteen happened. <laughs> so um, oh, so um, I yeah, which is like why I started talk group because I was just like I need to just like like get something out mm -hmm. um, and. Um, yeah, and so like I have one episode out right now and like Hell or High Water, I'm gonna get um, three more episodes done. Like three, the, th the reporting on the three episodes is pretty much done, but I just need to um, like work in the fiction part um, and I'm hopefully gonna get those done like by the spring. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, I think there's probably like an unshare button and then I'll spin a wheel. Oh, again. sorry. Yeah. You're like, can you, uh, can you? <laughs> no, no, that's good. Um, did anyone have any questions for Sam? I just think it's very cool. That was yeah. very yeah. cool. Yeah, that's tremendous. That's My great. question is that's really cool. <laughs> Less of a that's question, really more of a cool. comment. <laughs> uh, two part question. Offline, yeah. We can go play hot or not with all of the Berkeleyites. Hell yeah. <laughs> I, they, mo most of them were pretty hot they were pretty hot yeah but i've been you know locked inside away from other humans for a long time yeah <laughs> like Sex. furry like man in in cut off shorts and like a bandana in his hair is uh <laughs> looking kind of yeah <clears throat> Okay, I feel that button? like being locked indoors thing. I mean, the other day I saw a metal cylindrical object with a hook on the end, and I was like, <laughs> 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 <That was hot. laughs> "Okay, I'm gonna spin the wheel." Spin the wheel. Spin the wheel. Wait till you see a, a worm with a big old spiked mouth, and you're just like, mm. <laughs> "All right." It's gonna keep some standards though. The lag makes it look like it's not spinning. It's just kind of like flopping back and forth. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. All right. All right. Let me see if I can make this work. Give me one second. I think I'm going to have the same problem Mountain did. But we I can't wait to spin it next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a pee break real quick. And I definitely don't want to miss Yule's thing. So chat amongst yeah. yourselves. I'll be back in a sec. Cool. Sounds good. Give me a sec, uh, too, because I have to make sure this works. You make sure this is a thing. I have a question. Is it pronounced Yule or Ool? Yes. <laughs> okay, I, right. most, I usually just say Ool, so. Okay, cool. It's, uh, it's the latter half of Samuel, so. Oh. That's the way it works. Give me one sec, because I've got to figure out how Max is. Well, how do you say the last name then? Aramchek? Okay, so cool. Jack is from uh, Phil K. Dick's uh, Radio Free Album Myth, which was the original version of what came to be known as Vallis, um, which I think some people here are familiar with. Um, one sec here. I am not. Doing... I'm not, no. Okay, I'm having some but adjacent issue. I kind of went down a Phil K. Dick rabbit hole um, a year or two ago because I was like, what is all this hype and some of it's good and a lot of it's not um and like i was like kind of amazed at how i don't know why i was amazed but i was amazed at like how sexist man high castle is i was like and and also and also just like um like uh like the portrayal of of, of japanese americans or i guess Amer i guess well japanese americans has a different sense in this book but it was like pretty like I think that those like Japs was like used a lot. Um, and it was, yeah, he, it's weird. It's weird that he's like having this Renaissance right now. It's like of all the people to sort of like bring us through this moment. It's like, it's odd that he, that he's the one that like Hollywood is like glommed onto. But then we also got Atwood. So I guess it balances out. Yeah, I think I figured out the thing. Else I'm hoping we reboot Zoom just like Mountain did. It's exactly the same thing. I'll be right back, folks. I'm hoping that uh, that like Hollywood and uh, video producers start tackling um, Kim Stanley Robinson's work. It's like oh, really yeah. optimistic, like green future sci-fi, where things are still fucked up, but like it would be hard in different to ways. Portray yeah. that. Yeah, I've only read New York. I, was it New York twenty? 2140, 2148, something like that. I haven't read that one yet. It's on my list. That looks pretty, 
Yeah, the Red Mars trilogy is his like yeah iconic it's work. It's amazing. Yeah. All right. There was that uh that like uh what is this that film NER about the like the starship that gets knocked off course and just drifts forever in the cosmos. Um that's uh kind of like a it's a it's a colony ship disaster movie. Um that's apparently like super artsy and beautiful. Um, but that I mean it's kinda like Kim Stanley Robinson's Aurora, where you've got oh, this like generation ship that is just like in every single page is just constant tragedy. Aurora emotionally fucked me up for a long time. I think I read it around the 2016 election and I'm just like, I can't, <laughs> I can't be reading this right now. Wow. It's what? just so tragic to like watch generations of people like degrade oh, man. <laughs> over the course of like a, a long starship flight. What was the first thing that you mentioned? Um, uh, Aurora? The book Aurora? Oh, I thought I thought you said I thought you said Aurora was like something else. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that that movie, um, Aniara, I think it's called. Okay. Yeah, it's like a Danish film. We haven't seen it yet, but it's on our list. It's the same. It's a similar story. It's like a generational starship that goes off course, and you know things right. go wrong. I think there's there's a whole genre of like space bummer, like that movie. Highlight. <laughs> space <laughs> bummer, oh, man. alien. That's real. <laughs> space oh, right. bummer. <laughs> Friends, awesome. can everyone see where I'm at? Can they see and can they hear me? Yes. The yes. eight of yeah, buttons. YouTube. Can they make sure that YouTube can hear me? I've heard there might be some audio issues from my end. I just want to make sure that's clear. Oh, really? Here, well, let me. They're a couple minutes behind, but let me ask. Okay. If it's a couple minutes behind, uh, that shouldn't be an issue then. Um, I, I think it's it might be a temporal matter, but everyone here can hear me. <laughs> Yep, I can hear you fine, yeah. yeah. All right, sounds good. So this is the Eight of Buttons, a short lesson about seeing tarot in the world and sharks. So without further ado, I'm going to be talking about some of you have seen. Occasionally, I'll take photographs and associate them with tarot cards. Oh, this is you. I love these. Sorry. Oh, OK, yeah. <laughs> nope, this is me. Uh, but this is one of the things I do. I have a few different names and a few places I post things, um, but I, I think people can start piecing together who I am from XYZ. Um, and so I wanted to talk about this and I wanted to talk about tarot in general. It's a little more serious. It's a little less funny, I guess, than other things people have posted, but I hope I can I'm bring into it. something weird. It's a variety show. There. So... Without further ado, the hammer is a hideous thing. Its throat lies between its head and its face, and its single eye lies between all three. It has no mouth, and it must scream. <laughs> the hammer has <laughs> these problems. The head is where you expect it to be relative to the neck. The eyes are close enough to roughly where you would expect them to be. But the skull is different. The eyes are a little different. And this is actually evolutionary, evolutionarily very important because the hammerhead shark has what are called ampullae of Lorenzini. It has the ability to perceive electric potential. It can see the difference between salt water and a fish's skin with all of the organs that are arrayed along its skull. The eyes simply synthesize with this. It allows the eyes to see the sides of the fish to defend itself while those other organs do the majority of the hunting. There's an, optical, there's an optimal arrangement of sensory organs that actually allows the hammerhead shark to perceive in a way that we can't imagine. It's actually somewhat perfect for seeing in an aquatic environment. So what does this have to do with tarot? Well, I'm gonna talk about the classic Rider Waite deck and the five cent tarot, where in the Rider Waite deck, we have what is called the Eight of Pentacles, which is this man basically hammering on a bunch of pentacles to make a large scale object. He's an artisan, he's an apprentice. But on the other side, we have this hammerhead shark now, you've heard me say hammer twice, and you're starting to get the idea. 
Uh, but here we have buttons also, which is a new concept and a different concept that starts to take this in a different direction. So we're gonna see how we get from point A to point B. Now the eight of coins or the eight of pentacles or the eight of discs or the eight of buttons or whatever it is in a particular suit is the completion of a long-term material work is the most basic thing that the card illustrates. It's especially related to art. And it's also especially related to monastic discipline. Um, the card is, if you work through the astrological side of it, the sun in Virgo. And we're talking Virgo, don't think maiden in distress, think monks and nuns. It's about the discipline, it's about the focused work, it's about those structures. Now, next thing that's important is imagery of trees. Um, when we're talking about the, this particular card, um, trees factor into it, there's a question of scale of time. How long is this working? And so you can see in that top middle, that's from the Pagan Otherworlds deck. On one hand, we have the long-term growth of a tree, and on the other, we have the seasonal harvest. We have two questions of long-term growth being illustrated by the same art. Um, in all of these versions of the card, we have this sort of long-term disciplined work being what is illustrated, though in very different ways. And this starts to illustrate from that more better known card in the upper left, over time, different artists have taken this in different directions that have ultimately made a larger scale understanding of what this particular lesser known tarot card is. It's about that work and it's about that long-term work and its moment of completion. So back to this, what's interesting about the hammerhead shark, we've talked about its evolutionary pattern. We've talked about how this very bizarre creature has ultimately become you know, it's the best version of what is unique about a shark. Its skull is specifically designed to see things the way a shark does in the best way possible. Um, but in the original, remember hammer and hammer, we have the artisan and their hammer, and we see one organism come forward from these two beings. We see the hammer, we see the artisan, there's one organism that embodies that. And evolution has actually served as the arrangement of matter here. We have a very long-term scale perfection of what it means to be a shark in the weirdness of the hammerhead. And I find that really interesting. I find that to be really important about why the card can go from X to Y. And now from there, there's the secondary question, which is, why buttons? We moved from pentacles, from coins before it, to buttons. And so let's talk about buttons. Well, when we're looking at coins and when we're looking at buttons, we're looking at different ways of these small circular objects changing our relationship to matter and what it means. So with coins, we're minting a metal object and we're imbuing value and meaning into it. With buttons, we're fastening matter to matter to produce a different object. And so with this, buttons are what differentiate wool from a cardigan, just as much as what coins differentiate silver from a dollar. We're looking at the way these objects take matter and make it something valuable and interesting, something that we can find meaning in. That's not to say that money is particularly interesting or the buttons are particularly interesting on their own, but they serve as this sort of mundane tool by which we understand how meaning gets attached to matter or how matter attaches to matter to produce meaning. Coins and buttons are actually kind of close together when you think about it that way. Um, so moving on from that, um, this is something that's a complete chaos energy. Um, but once you get into Lacanian analysis, there's this idea of upholstery buttons being the way we assign meaning to particular symbols and 
In this, there's an analysis of the film Jaws in which Jaws becomes the thing that all of this, these different anxieties and meanings get assigned to at the time that it was published. So is it a fear of Cuban immigration? Is it fear of communism, et cetera? I won't go too far down into this, but buttons ultimately became associated with sharks and the way symbols assign meaning in the wild world of theory in such a way that when I was doing research on actually using this together, it became very bizarre and very interesting very quickly. So that is something that I'm not going to go too far down into, but suffice to say, you can take this rabbit hole as far down as you want to, because that's the nature of how tarot works. And that brings us to our next slide. So tarot provides the ability to basically find meaning within the cards as well as outside the cards. If you're reading tarot, you're talking about the way the cards reflect in the world, but an important part of that is being able to look at the world and see when something that is, you know, in, an important card or an important factor in tarot is actually meaningful. And every new artistic interpretation looks at an older version of tarot and asks, what can, how does this relate what's in the tarot to what's outside it? What's another way that we're seeing this in the world that would be artistically interesting? That being said, not every stick has an ace of wands and not every hammerhead shark is an eight of coins or pentacles or buttons or whatever you're familiar with, but this one is. Uh, someone actually made a sculpture of a hammerhead shark out of hammerheads and that is in fact the completion of a long-term work that combines the artisan's hammer and the hammerhead shark. So I found that fairly interesting. And so from that, um, sorry, looks like my mouse was in the wrong place. We can start to look at the different cards and we can start to see what are the fundamental elements that we're seeing in different places. How can we see the cards in different ways that we wouldn't necessarily? Um, you know, here is, for instance, where a place where the devil might be seen in the shadows of a pool hall. And you can see the different people who are held by chains uh, directly evidenced here. There's even chains in that moment attached to the devil himself. Or the Six of Wands, that's the war memorial in Indianapolis where you see the victorious feature and the Six of Wands propped upwards. Uh, the Fool, that's a moment when I happen to be on a train going from San Diego up to Los Angeles and that figure was just staring into in another dimension through some electronic billboard that was just coughing out aqua green light. He was just staring mesmerized at it. I had to take a picture of it. And when once you start getting these feels for what these cards are and what they mean, you'll start to see sometimes the imagery of it in the world around you is more uncanny than you would expect. It's not just seeing something that has the same meaning sometimes things show up a little more closely than you might expect. So I would encourage people to look through something like tarot or another, um, another medium that they find particularly attractive. So, I mean, the, uh, the Oracle of the Hypogeum, when we have liminal earth people here, that's also one that's very interesting. And start seeing if you can see the same thing. Start seeing if you can find those same associations and imagery together and you'll often find that you don't just get one or the other, you get both. And uh, that's my discussion. Uh, always keep your eyes open for new omens. That is wonderful, Yule. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thanks, dude. Yeah. It's like plants, but tarot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. All right. Yeah. Yeah, really you, are you making a full deck of those like photos? You know, I wasn't planning on it and they're square, which makes it a little tricky to actually uh, port that into a deck per se. You can get square decks printed, I'm certain of it. Yeah, you can get square decks printed. Uh, shuffling them is another matter. <laughs> but oh. yeah, let's see, there we go, stop share. And um, then you're, uh, you would have to have reversals meanings for all four positions. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
oh god i can't even begin to describe how many problems that would cause but <laughs> yeah it's, uh, yeah. it's pretty for you could just add a margin add a margin on the top and bottom yeah square image yeah 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 there you go problem solved yeah margin is <laughs> gonna be yeah maybe it'll happen we'll see how many do you have a lot i've got a big twitter thread so yeah I'm... yeah yeah no i've seen that it's cool i i enjoy watching that uh that thread and like recognizing images like oh that's from the den or yeah <laughs> it's going to keep uh it's going to keep growing once the world reopens but right. the time being there's a few uh fewer uh entries into it <laughs> right you're like your sock drawer is in like a really meaningful arrangement <laughs> <laughs> so the three of socks yeah yeah. Um, do, you want, do you want to tell people about the tarot deck that you made too? The, uh... Oh yes, there is in fact the Aramchak tarot, um, and there's not many copies of it left. Um, it was from a, a Twitter thread where I just started kind of shooting around, um, moving Arcana and doing sort of an anti an antipode to each Arcana as I went up. So it started with a network, which was an antipode to the fool and talking about all these crossing paths rather than a lonely path and then moving up to the magician and the android and the question of sort of this frankenstein narrative and as i made this thread uh this artist in switzerland lays farah who's great oh nate's started, got him wow yeah, yeah lays actually started illustrating all of these and so it sort of became a to shoot an elephant thing i absolutely had to keep making more and more descriptions in order to keep this going because he was making such beautiful art of it. And eventually this thing that I just sort of started as a tweet um, eventually became a tarot deck. And it's just kind of semi-majors. There's no minors in it. We've talked about making a bigger one, um, but that hasn't happened. It's mostly just a, a lovely little piece of art with um, alternate great. ideas that- I love them. I um I never used them, but I've got them framed on my wall. Love That's them. Awesome. That's wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. Hey, and I remember I, I remember I when you had my post about hand. the the um the found in the world one. Someone was like, "Who's this asshole? Like using all these photos?" And then you were like, "Oh, they're my photos." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> it's like, no, guys, I actually did take these pictures, but. <laughs> The asshole just ripping off all these photos. <laughs> I, I appreciated their their bulldog nature, but alas, um, I did actually take them. There was no one for them to attack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the internet! Yeah. How dare you capture an image? <laughs> hey, I have a question. Sure. What resources do you use to like get all this deep knowledge about tarot? Because I'm still a little tarot baby, but I find it very interesting, and I want to know more. Yeah, so I sort of dove in the deep end. I started cold reading for people as I was traveling a few years back. And I just went harder and harder on bringing tarot with me to bars or wherever I was when I was traveling and just starting working on it and eventually became a bigger thing. Now, I, I mean, there's, there's some good books absolutely on it. And I started from just kind of the flashcard method of pulling out a card and what does this mean to me? What does that mean? Especially with just like a, you can get little like thumb size rider weights that I find are really good for just like flipping through. Do I know what this means? Can I say with a straight face what this is to another person? And from there, it just sort of, it follows, but it, it's about, there's something very much about getting a feel for it. There's something very much about, you can pull all of these, cards you can look through all these books to tell you this is xyz meaning but there's ultimately a shape of some object behind those cards and meanings that you start to get a better picture for that sort of no single deck ultimately fully illustrates and it, it's something that i really do feel like once you have even one deck starting to see do i see something in the world that is this does this remind me of something I think that's a really good way to start digging into what the cards really mean. Because you do find often that when you're looking out at the world, it does get a little more on the nose than you would expect when, when you're looking at a particular arcana. It's not just every time you see 
a completed work of art is an eight of coins, but sometimes a work of art is an eight of coins and you really see that. Cool, thanks. Yeah, you bet. So is, is Buttons a, a, a suit in a, in a deck that you're designing or is that just like a one-off card? Um, so Buttons, um, Buttons is in the five cent tarot, their version of coins or pentacles. Oh, okay. So there's all those four suits, just like a Hoyle deck, um, but each one sort of has an elemental association too. I hope I'm still here. Am I still yeah. here? Yeah, okay. still here. Okay. Um, and so the lowest suit is always the round shape for the most part. Sometimes it'll be stones or something irregular, but in general, it'll be a coin or it'll be a pentacle, or it'll be a disc, or it'll be a button. It's, it's all, it's, there's a continuum of different things that people call it, but it's the same thing. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, the five centaur is kind of fun because it has buttons, uh, wands become matches, swords become mm -hmm. needles. It's all little things, which is <laughs> kind of fun about it. Yeah, I um, sometime I want to sit down with you and just get tons of stories from you about reading strangers tarot while traveling. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I know you, you told me about reading DMX's tarot right before I went to jail. Wait, I did what? Not, I did not. Carry the lead. I read DMX. I, DMX bought me a drink, but I never got to read him uh, okay. because that All bar right. actually banned me from reading tarot. They said, <laughs> did they really? Sure, <laughs> gambling at our establishment. And so I, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But D, DMX was a really interesting guy. Um, really a bizarre scenario of sitting down and uh, the person who sits down next to you is DMX. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not going to take up too much time on that one, but that's, yeah. uh, that was a moment in, uh, in my journeys for sure. <laughs> Where was that? Oh, what was that? Where was that? Uh, that was at Boston's W Hotel, actually. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Should we spin the Nick wheel? <laughs> Give it a if spin. it lands right on the line, is that what does that mean? <laughs> that means we have to all start over again. Oh no! Uh, I think it means Jeremy has to go again because that is literally liminal. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we're swapping spots because uh, my computer is the only one that can present what keynote presentation. Yeah, sure. I, I must regrettably be going, but it's yeah, an absolute I... delight. Um, have a lovely evening. Okay. And Nick, I'm going to watch yours, you know, tomorrow or something. So, Peace yeah, out. I have to run as well, but this was okay. awesome. Thanks for inviting me, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm so happy you could make it and make something for it. Your thing was really beautiful. Thanks. Nice meeting you all. Yeah. Bye. Good to see you. Nice meeting you. Rapidly running out of light. You ever notice how some couples start to look like each other? You cut out for a second. Say again. And I can't hear you. Can you hear us? You can probably I, hear me through my computer. Yes, I can hear Nick through. Is there, um, hmm. Try hitting mute and then unmuting and then remuting. This happens to me a lot on work Zooms. Maybe you should do the whole thing in mime. <laughs> I 
audio probably. Oh, I hear. Can you hear us now? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Great. <laughs> now, how do I get that screen on that one? <laughs> also, Nick, I like your hat. Thank you. Uh, that one, yeah. So what you're going to do is you'll share a screen, you'll choose Keynote, and then when you hit play, it'll show only the presentation screen. Great. And your deck will be over here. Fantastic. Ready? All right. Now I know how to use a computer. <laughs> OK. Share screen. Uh, <laughs> Take your time. I'm just going to drink more whiskey. Yeah. Uh, I'm just I'm just having fun hanging out with you guys. Hell yeah. yeah. This is great. I am so happy that this came together. And uh, all of your presentations were wonderful. Made me really happy. Very high quality. Yeah. <laughs> you guys see... bars are always so much fun. Would you guys be up for doing this again? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Cool. Because my presentation is a replay, and it's extremely low quality. And I'm sorry that this is the end cap of our night. This it is. is it is not low quality. Um, can you guys see my screen at all? No. Nope. Yeah. No. I just see your beautiful face. Uh, okay. What if I click share here? Yes. 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 There we Perfect. Go. OK, I have to say that the last time that I tried to do this, I really fucked it up. And it looked like the presentation wasn't going at all. And I was just talking for like three minutes straight. So if you don't see an animation uh, here in the next few seconds, let me yeah. know. This uh, presentation is about a video game I like called Stardew Valley. Um, or do you see that animation? Yeah. The best yeah. game you can play if you like to play video games sometimes, or even more often than that. <laughs> <laughs> Stardew Valley. So uh, what is Stardew Valley besides a video game? Well, I'll have you know, Stardew Valley is a video game. Uh, it's an indulgent fantasy of a life better than, uh, than certainly mine right now. Um, you know, living in quarantine, frontline worker, going out into the, the plague wastes just to make my, my coin. Um, Stardew Valley is a lot more fun than that. It's, uh, I think it's a role-playing game. I don't know much about video games, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, I uh, have never really owned a gaming console until one week ago, uh, in which I purchased a, a Switch for quarantine. Um, but I don't know much about video games, but I do know that Stardew Valley is the best video game. Um, I also think it's a role-playing game. I'm not really <laughs> sure. Um, I, I am it told is, it is a farm simulator. Yeah, there you go. It's a far, it's a, it's definitely a farm simulator, a farm role. I, and I love it. Go on. Uh, it is extremely good and relaxing, and it's fantastic for quarantine. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert. So this is what happens in the game. So the curtains open on, unfortunately, your uh, sweet grandpa's uh, deathbed, where he gives you a letter, um, and he says, don't open that. And then he gives you a depressing monologue about death and how life is miserable. Um, he, he then basically tells you that the, uh, you know, when you feel the crushing weight of life, you can open this letter. Next thing you know, cutscene. You're working in an Amazon call center. It's such a bad workplace that one of your coworkers was literally dead. It's very obvious that you hate your life and you remember the letter that your gramps gave you, which you have kept in the drawer of your work uh, desk. You open that shit up, man. Oh my God, it's a deed to a farm in a cool little agricultural art village by the sea. You can quit your shit job to toil in the fields and befriend villagers. Officially, hell yeah, this shit rules. <laughs> you then take the bus out into the countryside to Stardew Valley. You get to know your cool new plot of land. Before long, you're meeting townsfolk. You're making jokes about the mayor, who's actually a pretty good guy. Farming takes work, and you've got to clean up your yard. There's too many sticks and rocks and shit. Just get that shit out of here. Clean it up. Make it look nice. Uh, you start befriending townsfolks and giving them gifts and doing quests and stuff for them, just like you would do in any small little arts village by the sea. Um, a dog comes over and it becomes your dog. Or you, you can set it to be a cat if you want, if that's your thing, but I'm, I'm all about the Stardew Valley dog, the farm dog. Uh, there's festivals that you can go to. Uh, 
there's a game mechanic where you can date people and eventually you can even get married uh, to pretty much anyone except for the wizard, which is the... I've written the developer and said that you should allow the wizard to be a dateable character. It's certainly a married <laughs> character. Um, True as hell. You can pet your dog and there's nothing in game that would make it die uh, because fuck video games where the fucking dog dies. That is who it, <laughs> just don't do that in my humble opinion. Haven't played much video games, uh, but I know that when the dog dies, that's a, officially a bad video game. Uh, you can customize your character to look however you want. Mine looks like me. Oh, wow. Perfect. Um, Very good resemblance. I hear you say, Nick, what's it look like? All I give a shit about is graphics these days. I don't want to be stupid at, and then I show you Stardew Valley and you go, oh my God, oh, those pixels. They're so serene and beautiful. And I say, look at that little shed over there. And I say, look at, that's my greenhouse. And I can point over there and you can see where all of my cows hang out. And then you see me over here petting my pig, all right? And there's a cow and it loves me. And I don't know about your video games, but I don't think you can pet a cow or a pig in your video game. This is, this is the town. No, star, no townspeople here right now. This is just what it looks like. This is a map of it. There's all kinds of cool stuff you can do. There's shops. There's a blacksmith. There's a guy in the library who will accept your donations of the artifacts you find in the mines. There's a, there's a game mechanic where you can go to a luau and hang out and talk to all the people in the game about how awesome it is to be at the luau and living in Stardew Valley. You see that dude in the purple suit kind of up there in the, at the very top? That's the governor. And you That's get the governor Jay Inslee. That's Jay Inslee. And you know what you get to do for Jay Inslee? That big tub in the middle of the screen, that's the community soup. And you can put whatever you want in that soup. And depending on what you put in it, the governor will, will favor your town. It's crony, it's crony capitalism right there for you. But you know what? <laughs> Stardew Valley is a beautiful town and I like participating in the governor's soup. I also like participating in the art of fishing. So down by the, down by the fish shack where Willie lives, you can, you can go deep sea fishing there's all kinds of stuff you can do. You can catch all kinds of animals. Anything from a, from a, you can catch a flounder. You can even catch a fish called a super cucumber. It's a sea cucumber that is purple. Um, you can go into the mines uh, if you are such a daring soul. If you do so, you will be invited into the Adventurers League. Look at these beautiful things you can catch. You can, I mean, crystals, plants, uh, beautiful stones. You can you knock them to pieces and get all sorts of stuff to build out your dream life in the valley. Um, there's the wilderness, man. Fuck. God. Look at that. <laughs> this is incredible. I just can barely even contain. It's majestic as hell. Um, Stardew Valley. It's good and relaxing. So here's some things that you can do in Stardew Valley, the video game. Um, if you're into video games where you're micromanaging, um, I'm assuming that's a uh, category of video games, not just Stardew Valley. And this is probably going to be great for you. You can farm vegetables, you can farm fruits and grains, you can raise farm animals, and you can also pet them. Uh, you can pet your dog. There's mining and cave exploring. You can fight monsters and, uh, and uh, just all kinds of crazy stuff in the mines. Um, when you're out of the mines and just in town, you can befriend the townsfolk and you can, you can do favors for them. Just, you know, nice things for people that you live with in your community. Um, you can get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Um, it doesn't even matter. You can date anyone except the wizard. Um, you can craft items, all kinds of important things. Um, I recently crafted a worm bin, which will make um, some delightful uh, bait for my fishing rod efforts. Um, you can cook food. You can eat that food, and you can give that food to people that you like. Um, you can fish for fish and other creatures that live in or around bodies of water. Um, the primary mechanic of Stardew Valley, as far as I um, am aware, is animals that you can have and pet. Um, here's a list of animals that you can pet in Stardew Valley. There's a dog. Uh, you can pet a cat. Um, you can pet a chicken. Um, there are cows that you can pet. In addition to cows, there are ducks. Um, goats are um, an animal in Stardew Valley you can pet, uh, as well as rabbits. Uh, they are pettable. Um, sheep, um, you can pet them. Uh, you definitely can pet them. Uh, there's pigs that you can pet. Uh, you can pet the dinosaur um, if you get the dinosaur egg and 
put it in your, you can pet a dinosaur. Um, and additionally, there is the hell chicken. Um, they're all animals that you can pet and they are all demonstrated uh, on the slide here on your screen. Um, I don't think that this type of person is in the crowd tonight, but I might hear some dumb idiot probably saying something stupid like this game sucks. Um, and those people are wrong um, in, oh, there's an animation. Um, this is how I feel about this game. I feel very good about Stardew Valley and this uh, wraps up my presentation. Thank you very much. For this. That is wonderful. Thank you, Nick. Wonderful. Uh, I, ha I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, purple super sea cucumber. Uh, yes. Um, when will we get an emoji for that? <laughs> no, that's, that's what I um, really want to know. Um, uh, it's it's coming up one of these one of these days. Um, I'll I'll write an email to uh, Tim Apple over there at the. the <laughs> what he's got to say about it. Um, am I still sharing my screen? I really can't. You are. Yes, yeah, so it. There's yeah. a red little chair <laughs> at the top. Is it? No, nah, that's Creative Cloud. Okay, I'll, I'll <laughs> <laughs> when will our culture uh, let it be acceptable for people to date wizards? Right, I know. So just on the whole, quite frankly. Yeah. Boom. Did pretty it. much the only thing keeping <laughs> me from becoming a wizard. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Um, what, what is it that, will, what will it take our culture to accept people dating wizards as a whole? Not, not just within Stardew Valley, but in general. That's a good question. Um, I think that we are well into a time where um, dating and even um, uh, marrying wizards is an acceptable thing that you can do um, uh, within certain pockets of the population. And I think that uh, the challenge is going to be um, increasing representation, making people aware that wizards are in fact need of love too, um, and uh, can give love in a way that is truly beautiful. Um, just like any of the rest of us. Uh, I think we need to to shout it from on high that wizards uh, need love and would like you to marry them. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any closing fun. thoughts? Yay. We should do this again, is what I would say. Yes. I think so, yeah, too. Definitely. This rocks. And next time, I will make my presentation before the day that I give it. No, I think that's kind of, <laughs> it's not a part of the rules officially, but yeah. it ends up being that you always make the presentation the day of. Uh, well, I, yeah, that's uh, the one that, that you hosted recently. Um, I did it last second and I had like a couple frames that I made and then I, and then I just riffed for the rest of it. So. Have, have you all heard of the concept of a uh, uh, PowerPoint karaoke? From you. Go on. The, no. the idea is that everyone makes a PowerPoint and then they're all kind of just like randomly shuffled up in presentation order. And then someone who did not make it with no forewarning of what is in the PowerPoint opens it up and presents it live. I think it that sounds, sounds amazing. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I want to do it. I want to yeah. do it. I will play. The trick is pretending that like you're really familiar with the subject matter too. Yeah. Pretending you're an expert is always fun. Mm -hmm. Hey, Pipe Cork is watching. Hi, Pipe Cork. Our good friend, Pipe Cork. David is here. Oh my God, I love that guy. I love all of you. It's true. And I, everyone that's in the comments, subscribe and like. <laughs> <laughs> Mash that motherfucking like button. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, this guys. is really fun, guys. This has been great. Yeah. All right, well, it'll happen again soon then. Thanks to everyone that watched and uh, later. Bye-bye. Watch me fumble for the button that makes this stop. <laughs> <laughs> stay, stay tuned, stay tuned. Here comes the blooper reel. Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody. <laughs>